Dear Sir, Dear David, Merry Christmas and I hope you have a very happy new year. I'm very sorry about the thing that happened. It was a very odd moment and I feel like a prize idiot. Particularly because if you can't say it at Christmas, when can you, eh? I'm actually yours with love. You're Natalie. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where we are continuing our exploration of Richard Curtis's Love Actually. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roca. I'm a writer, producer, host, and critic on the Outlaw Nation channel. Excited to be jumping back into this one as we get into the meaty storylines of Love Actually. And we are, of course, very, very happy to welcome back to our microphones one of our favorite guests and a true expert in all things holiday, animation writer and executive, Michael Vogel. Welcome back to The Cinephiles. Thank you. I thought you were going to say I was an expert in all things love and I was going to have to be like, not even a little bit, but no, I'll take, I'll take holidays. That. I'll take holidays. That, that I'll take. So yes, thank you. Glad to be back and glad to talk more <laughs> about um, one of my top holiday movies. Well, and for those of you who decided to skip part one, you're in luck because we are approaching this movie in an entirely different way, which since it is, in fact, a whole bunch of different stories edited together, we are removing all that editing and tackling it one storyline at a time as if these are short films. So let me, let's get into a story about Sarah, Carl, and her brother, Michael. <laughs> so Sarah, played by Laura Linney, first she's at a wedding with her friend Jamie, and then she sees this lovesick guy at a wedding reception. And I was thinking about, you know why she recognizes that he's a lovesick guy? Because she's a lovesick girl, you yeah. know? And not only does she recognize him, but apparently everybody recognizes what she's going through because she gets back to work and her boss calls her into the office and tells her to switch off her phone and ask, exactly how long it is that you've been working here? And she says, two years, seven months, three days, and I suppose, what, two hours? And how long have you been in love with Carl, our enigmatic chief designer? <laughs> and she repeats exactly the same thing. And so this is Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman is amazing. And it's I love seeing him in this part because it is a very different kind of part for him. Mm. And... Besides the fact that it's sort of weird having your boss call out your personal life in this manner. Do you think everybody knows? Yes. And then with all of this insecurity and pain, she says, Do you think Carl knows? Yes. Bars is sort of maybe the time had come to do something about it. Like what? Invite him out for a drink, and then after about 20 minutes, casually drop into the conversation the fact that you'd like to marry him and have lots of sex and babies. You know that? Yes. And so does Carl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Laura Finney is so lovely. And, and you know what, J Michael, you're completely 100% right. Because what has he just told her to do? Tell the truth. Right. Yeah. And we and we have Daniel saying, I wish I had told my wife that she I loved her every single day yeah. because she was perfect every single day. We have Mark telling the truth. We have Sam happy that he told the truth. And now what's the message to Sarah, go tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And just as she's exiting, we see Carl, who is a, a fine-looking gentleman, I'll Ooh. say. Girl. <laughs> you, you said it, sister. <laughs> By the way, I haven't said a lot of filmmaking stuff, but uh, uh, it was very difficult to color correct this scene because there's so much light blasting in through all those windows in the offices. It was really hard to balance everything out. There is a there is a filmmaking thing. <laughs> there hasn't been a lot of them. Um uh, and as soon as she walks outside of the door, her cell phone rings. And this is going to become the painful buzzer that's going to interrupt everything. And we hear her smile, a, a complex smile, and say, Babe, absolutely far away. Later on, she's putting on makeup, and she sees Carl get up across the office. It's late at night. They're turning off lights. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Carl. My feelings about how Carl feels about her have changed. Okay. Like, I think initially when I saw it, I thought that she was way more aware of Carl than Carl was of Sarah. Mm. But watching it this last time, I go, you know what? Maybe Carl is just as into Sarah as Sarah is into Carl. Mm. Oh, I think he for sure is. Yeah. Like, I mean, 
clearly everyone in the office has been talking about this for the entire time. And I don't think Alan Rickman is, and, and even though like bosses probably shouldn't have that conversation, it's a little inappropriate. Bosses have those kinds of conversations all sure. the time. And I think that him kind of being like, you need to go do this. I don't think he's saying just to do it with no clue. I think everyone is yeah. well aware of the fact that like, Hey, Carl, Carl is in. Carl thinks yeah. you're really cool. He just doesn't, he's a shy guy. He's, you know, he's enigmatic. He's our chief designer. He's very busy. Um, but like, if you just put yourself out there, like it's going to work. Like you should just do this. Yeah. yeah. I think that's totally correct. Of course, she's not making progress with this plan of talking to Carl. There's one shot. It's late at night and it's Sarah with a little tiny Christmas light. You want to know why this is in the movie? Why? Because when they shot it, Laura Linney, told Richard Curtis, there's no way you're putting this in the movie. And he bet her a hundred dollars that he would. <laughs> Maybe it was a hundred pounds. Um, and so it's in there wow. in the midst of a lot of sort of Christmassy montages. And we get to the big uh, Christmas party dance mm. where Carl comes up to her and says, just one more dance before I run out of chances. By the way, Carl is uh, Brazilian. His name is Rodrigo Santoro. Yeah. I think he's really great and obviously really sexy in this movie. And they go to dance. Whew, girl, and you said it, sister. I'm just going to keep saying that, that every time he comes up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair. Well, we got a couple of really good ones then, so I, I expect some more girls. Um, he's a god king. He's yep, a god, he's a god king. king. From 300, of course, he's going to be hot. <laughs> um, and they dance at a classically. It's sort of a fast tempo dance that ends and immediately we're in a slow dance it's beautiful it's yeah. watching their facial expressions watching where their hands are watching him move his face in close to her her smile as they dance he's driving her home it's their looks we get to the door and then there's a long pause as they say good night and then he kisses her cheek and then it's a real kiss uh, actually i don't have to go right good i, I mean no no no, no that's that's good and they go inside, <laughs> and this moment is the best. Would you excuse me for one second? And she steps around the wall, up onto the step, <laughs> turns the light on, and does this unbelievably cute and goofy little silent celebratory moment. It's great. <laughs> okay, that's done. Um, <laughs> why don't you come upstairs in about 10 seconds? 10 seconds. 10 seconds. <laughs> She goes upstairs, <laughs> cleans her room very quickly, uh, hides the teddy bear under the bed, and then he comes up, and it is so romantic, and it is so lovely, and it is so tender. And it um, is so sexy. <laughs> oh, girl. Girl? Girl. <laughs> girl. <laughs> By the way, that, that, ladies and gentlemen, was my first girl <laughs> ever. You did it really well. Yeah, I was very we impressed. Work, we got to work I was, on it. Yes, no, it was good. It was good. Tens across the board, Steve. I loved it. I approve. Uh, I was nervous about it, but I, I'm, I'm really glad that I did it. What if he said it with a question? You will say, girl. Oh, yeah, you can good. say girl. You, girl? Girl. Girl. <laughs> girl. <laughs> you can, if, you're, um, if you're with your gay friends, you can have an entire conversation that covers politics, Shakespeare, <laughs> science, <laughs> And you can only use the word girl and it will all be understood. First of all, that's like a fabulous SNL sketch. <laughs> and I think we should film fabulous. it. By the way, I think his pants sort of magically disappear at a certain moment. Um, uh, and things are getting hot and heavy. And I like that he's having trouble getting her, her top off and she goes, just tug it. <laughs> and it's super sweet and it's super romantic. And she's, Things are moving right along, and the cell phone rings. And it rings again, and she says, I, I, I better answer that. It's like, no, you shouldn't better get that. Right. You shouldn't get that. Hi, hello, darling. No, no, I'm not busy. And what's interesting, we don't know what the phone call is at this point. Right. And as the phone calls start, you're like, who is she talking to? And then you hear... I, I'm not quite sure it's going to be possible to get the Pope on the phone tonight. But And now we're starting to get, oh, she's talking to someone who's got some kind of mental health issues. Right. And she hangs up. And I think initially that was the all the scene. Mm. And then they were doing testing and the audience really needed more to understand what was going on. And I'm not sure which parts of this were new and which parts weren't, but there was things I think added to the scene. It's my brother. He's, he's not well. He calls a lot. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, it's, it's not really fine. It is what it is. And 
sort of there being no parents now and us being over here, it's, it's my job to keep an eye on him. I mean, not my job. Obviously, I'm, I'm glad to do it. Which, to be clear, she's not. Well, I mean, she, yeah. she loves her brother, I think. Yeah. But just saying I'm glad to do it is not really what the truth is, you know? I mean, like, I don't know. I, I haven't had this situation, obviously, but I've had to take care of people in certain situations. Um, yeah. And in, in particular, one who was not the nicest person, mm-hmm. actually two, now that I'm thinking about that, weren't the nicest person. And I did it because I was right to do it. Yeah. I wasn't always glad to do it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but were those people your brother? One was my grandmother. The other is my father-in-law. Okay. So Yeah. I mean. It's not easy. It does, it's not easy. No. And then we think we're going to get back to it. And they kiss. And she lies down. And the phone rings. Mm. And Carl says, and this to me is such a key line. He says, we're not making better. No. And the ringing continues. There's a long looks, and she goes and answers the phone. Yeah. How do you guys feel at this moment? This storyline annoys the the shit out of me, so <laughs> I'm not thrilled about it. Uh, I don't like it, but I don't. the The fact that she answers the phone actually is not what bothers me because I actually think that that is probably right. I think that, and again, like this is clearly a story about her love for her brother is what this storyline is about. And so the fact that she is always going to be there for him is what her character should do in that moment. It's kind of where everything happens post her doing that, uh, where I'm like, "Mm, I don't think that this is a good story. I don't like where this goes. I don't think that this has a good uh, message at the end. Hmm. Like to me, I don't, if Carl is as lovely and perfect and amazing as he seems to be both physically and uh, otherwise, um, the, the the story that says you have to make this choice kind of bothers me. Mm-hmm. Like find you a person that is going to be like, if this is so important, like, Hey, we can have ho- super hot, sweaty sex later. Yeah. Let's go to the hospital. Let me drive you. Let me do this. How can I be like, how can I be helpful? Like the idea that you can either have the man of your dreams or, do what's right and responsible for the family member that you love uh, bothers me. And like we've said with all of these stories, each one of these is sort of a parable. And this is sort of saying that sometimes you think you want this one thing, but the real romance, the real love in your life is this thing. And that's mm-hmm. fine, but it just, is that, what, is that what you think this is saying? I don't that really the real know. Love of, I, that's well, not how I, yeah. here's, well, here's the thing. I think that I, either that or it's a super sad story. And in a rom-com Christmas movie where everything has a happy ending, the fact that her and Emma Thompson both sort of end up in these really shitty positions by the end, it always bugs me because both of them deserve better. Like Laura Linney, like Sarah's character actually deserves like, I don't think that her love for her brother, like, but like at the end of the movie where we see her at the end is... I'm having Christmas with my brother in the inst- in the in the in the facility that we keep him in and we've got scarves on and that's as good as my life is going to get. Yeah. So I'm either going to choose that that is what she wants or I'm going to choose that this is a super sad story and a shitty ending for her and if it's a sad ending then it's saying she made the wrong choice which I also think isn't right. So it bothers me. Well, I think you know Lindley hates this movie for the two <laughs> things you buy. and look she's a massive Bigger Anglophile than I am. And a lot of people in this movie are some of our favorite actors in British TV and films. So I was so surprised when I said, hey, we're going to do Love Actually this week. We're going to watch it. You want to watch it with me? And she's like, no. And then she specifically pointed out how it, how much the men succeed in this movie and how much the women mm. do not. And she said, like the Laura Linley, Laura Linney situation, the fact that she uh, ends up in a situation like this with a guy, I guess, who's making her choose And so her love actually is the love (laughs) between her and her brother. And then Emma Thompson, her love actually is her having to deal with this situation with her husband and his infidelities because she's staying for the kids. Now, in a vacuum, you can say both of those are actually really interesting storylines because they explore the fact that love can be very difficult, especially when it's a family member doing these things and you have to kind of navigate that. It's tough. And there's some nobility in that. The other side of it, too. There's some nobility in having to stay in a situation here because you love your kids. You're the better person. You're the more moral person uh, in this situation between her and Alan Rickman. But as a whole totality in the movie, it's a little bit uh, the scales are way are tipped way more in favor of the men 
in this yep. movie. And yeah, so my, what Michael points out is absolutely right. I, I think she's incredible in the film, Laura Linney, and oh, yeah. the moments that she's playing and the acting. And yeah, you're right. And Carl, uh, is that his name, Carl? Is that, is that yeah, his name? Carl. What is it, Carl? Yes? Carl. Yeah. Carl. Yes. Girl. <laughs> Girl. I mean, he's he he's noticed her and he's interested in her. So to him, he only sees her as a hookup or a fling or whatever. He there's no indication that he sees her as some kind of future relationship. So that's why he falls by the wayside. But and I so, think but I think from like even a more technical like how Richard well, his smoky decided, eyes fooled you is what I'm saying. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah I mean, they could fool me. I'd be fine. <laughs> but, uh, but like I think that the the choice here would be like if Laura Linney it, it, it's more like if Carl becomes the asshole of this story. Like right. if Carl is this guy that she's wanted her whole life and then she kind of reveals this, she's going to have awesome sex with Carl. And then yeah. this thing happens. She's like, well, look, this is really important. Do you mind if I deal with this and can we do this later? Right. And he's like, Hey, tonight's the night. And yeah. then she's like, well, fuck you. I choose this. And then, right. and then it's more of a story of like, yes, I want love, but I want to find someone who loves all of me. And that yeah. part of me is that I take care of my yeah. brother who I care very the, deeply about. Right. Then that's a more story right. for her. This story just Empowering. kind of ends in a sputter of like, yeah. Oh wow. Well, I guess you got to take care of your brother. That sucks for you. You don't get hot Carl. The yeah. end. Well, it, it's so funny because <laughs> this is obviously op open to a lot of interpretation. Oh yeah. I have never ever seen it as, Oh, the true love of her life is her brother. Mm. I, and that she's that she, I've never seen that. It, what's yeah. interesting is that John had kind of said, well, Carl's not looking for a long-term relationship yeah. thing. And that's how I had always seen it until the last two times I watched it um, because I watched it and I was kind of going through it again. And this time I went, maybe Carl is actually more interested in her in a serious way than I had thought he was before. That's a key variable. Um, but the thing to me is this is a story, you know, Michael, you had said that this is a film about people speaking their truth. And this is Sarah not speaking her truth. She is not saying how she really feels about Carl. And I think, well, I do think she loves her brother. And I do, yeah. but I also think she feels a strong sense of duty to her brother. And I also think she is sacrificing herself in a way that is extremely painful for me to watch. Well, you know, yeah. that she is saying she is giving up on her own happiness. And to some degree, I won't say she's using her brother as an excuse. I don't mean it exactly like that, but she doesn't have to answer that phone. Like it, when Carl says, is this going to make any difference? The answer is no. She says it's not going to make any difference. Right. You know, is it, I'm not saying that she shouldn't be there for her brother, right. but to answer the phone every single time this person calls, that's, and say, I can't have a life because I have to answer this phone when answering the phone will do no good. That is, but this is where I, I agree. I agree. Actually, I agree with everything you said, and I don't think that that situation from with her brother is making her happy. So it's not the love right. of her life. But I think that's what she chooses no, right. by the end of the Absolutely. movie. That is what she chooses. And that's I think that title. here's where here's where Richard Curtis gets in trouble, and why Lindley, the Lady Outlaw, hates this movie, and a lot of people do, which yeah. is each one of these stories, like Emma Thompson and Laura Lenny, are the two females in this movie that drive a story of their own. Yeah. All yeah. the other females are as, as big as they are and as great as they do are in some level in service to the male's storyline. Yeah. yeah. And so this is a movie that says, if you are a male and you go speak your truth to a woman who is often in a subservient position to you, you uh, get what in, you want in any language. and you get it all and you get to be yeah. happy and you get love and you get all of it. But the two women in this storyline yeah. uh, who don't speak their truth end up kind of in super shitty positions and, and in service to the men. Her yep. brother is a man. Her brother calling her at any moment knows she'll pick up the phone and she'll yeah. come. Your brother in the hospital gets yep. you a hundred percent of the time. Yes. Cause you're never going to choose your own happiness. Right. And right. Alan Rickman kind of gets off scot-free for doing something super shitty. And Emma Thompson at the end of the movie looks like she's having the worst time of her life. Which is why I think the title applies here. And, I, and I, I think we've all come around this idea. It's not that her brother is the love of her life. It's that this is love, actually. And sometimes love actually can suck. Sometimes love is commitment right. to the brother, the family member. Sometimes right. love is staying when you don't want to stay in this relationship or this marriage 
because the kids are more important because you love your kids. That's love, actually. So I think but that's apparently what, the men get the love in this movie. Exactly. And the women and the women right. get the actually the actually you're a thousand well, percent correct there. Well, and the other thing <laughs> is that, that that this relates to is this idea of objectification and treating the, the right. object of your affection as non-human is that. Kira Knightley's character, we don't get to meet her very much. He mm -hmm. obsesses with her visually. The Joanna, we talk about this whole movie. We don't know very much about her other than that she sings. Right. Like the and and this is and in this case, Carl is the objectified one. That's for sure. Um, but then she she rejects it. You know what I mean? Like in the end, mm -hmm. she chooses not to have love. It's it, this story. This story to me, it's not as profound yeah. is the emma thompson one but it really makes me upset yeah. in a different way because i'm very uh I, I you know it's it's not it's a thing i've struggled with to some degree honestly mm -hmm. of like sacrificing my own needs for other things and trying to figure out or for other people and trying to figure out what i need yeah um and so maybe that's why it hits me so viscerally mm. of watching her do it and then we go to, because the next, then we go to her at this facility with her brother. The nurses are trying to kill me. Nobody's trying to kill you, babe. And he goes to hit her. And it is very clear because she catches it so easily mm -hmm. that this is not the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, or the sixth time yeah. that he has physically attacked her. Right. It's happened a lot. Um, and she just calms us down and, and the, it's calling him my darling and my love and my babe and all this stuff. And it's like, man, she is, again, I'm not saying she doesn't love her brother, but mm -hmm. she is playing the role of how she feels about him to him for him. And I think part of her hates him. Yeah. But wow. again, and again, that's where this, and look, all of this as a character study of someone who's dealing with something like this, super interesting. And Laura Linney is obviously nailing every moment, but oh, yeah. where this fits in with the rest of this happy, beautiful, isn't love and Christmas and telling the truth, beautiful right. storyline is it, it always strikes me as a bit of an outlier. Yeah. It's a, you know, cause it's, I think it's a kind of clumsy attempt to, um, uh, tackle, you know, mental health, issues or whatever is going on for this person who clearly has some kind of psychotic situation or mental situation going on. And so it was kind of an attempt to do that. And I think I agree with both of you that it does kind of fail a little bit because there is no real kind of closure to this. Cause I think there's another scene and he's dressed up in Christmas clothes or whatever, but it doesn't really come to any kind of satisfying conclusion. Yeah, I mean, she, you know, we're back in the office and she, Carl says goodnight and she says goodnight and she doesn't say, hey, Carl, and tries to yeah. speak her truth. She doesn't. And she, he leaves and she's sad. And then we go to her at Christmas with her brother in this institution. Yeah. And I really feel, and that's the last we see of her. Yeah. I yep. really feel this is it for Sarah. Yep. Sarah's yeah. not, she's not going to have happiness right. in her life. Right. Um. So Until that her was. Her brother a, dies. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a fucking bummer. <laughs> so, that story is that's really wrong, rough. actually. All right. And what's so, and, and this is what's funny is divide. I, I am glad that we've divided these into short films because that gets um, that pain of this gets assuaged by the fact that we're intercutting with other things that are much more happy. Yeah, you know. Um, and so, if you just were to watch this as a short film, you would walk out and go, "Oh my god, <laughs> that was brutal." Yeah. Yeah. You know what you would do? You'd walk out and you look at your friend and you'd be like, "Girl." <laughs> <laughs> um i think it is time to have a story of international political importance oh boy and that is the story of david and natalie mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, by the way i just want to take a moment for hugh grant as the prime minister of great britain <laughs> i don't i don't believe him as the prime minister for a second <laughs> even though we have a very bizarre Prime Minister of Britain at this moment. Yeah, Boris. Um, but yeah, I, I don't I don't really believe Hugh uh, Hugh Jack I wrote Hugh Jackman in my notes, by the way. I, mean, I, don't I believe, believe Hugh Jackman is the Prime Minister. That I'm into. Hundred uh, percent. Um uh anyway, he arrives at 10 Downing Street, walks in. This is obviously his first day on the job, and meets his assistant and then gets introduced to his household staff, says some inappropriate things to an older gentleman. <laughs> um, uh, I do adore Hugh Grant in his awkward, funny, uh, yeah. embarrassed way. Yeah. And then gets introduced to Natalie. Yeah. This is Martin uh Martin McCutcheon. Mm -hmm. Um, and by the way, in the script, Richard Curtis always wanted her for the part and so the character's name was martine huh. 
Um, and then he changed it to Natalie before he gave her the script because she didn't. He didn't want her to get cocky and know that she already had the part. Oh, Jesus. Hello, Natalie. Hello, David. I mean, sir. It's beautifully awkward. Mm. Shit, I can't believe I've just said that. <laughs> and now I've gone and said shit twice. <laughs> I'm so sorry, sir. It's fine. It's fine. You could have said fuck, and then we'd have been in real trouble. <laughs> Which is lovely and charming. Well, he she does follow up by saying, uh, "I knew I was going to fuck this up." I did think I was going to fuck it up. Yeah, <laughs> and then it becomes a whole thing. So yeah. Uh, and he walks away and goes into his office, closes the door, and says, "Oh no, that is so inconvenient." Again, I actually think they're great together. I yeah. think they have great chemistry. I really enjoy them. But the idea that the prime minister of a country has one glimpse of an attractive assistant and is instantly in love with her and is like, this is going to be inconvenient. It's like, it's so, again, it's that objectification thing. You well, know? I mean, I think that I'll give them a little bit of a pass on it because realistically, in real life, we all have those moments where we walk into an office meeting mm. or we walk into a place and you have that person who does take your breath away. Now, and I do think that particularly in this storyline, we'll get to it. He does make an effort to get to know her a little bit better. And we do see yeah. that they have some conversations. So it's not like some of the other stories where it's just like, boom. But like, I mean, dude, I remember once I went up to uh, Boulder, Colorado to this app company that Hasbro was working with. And we had a big meeting about this game they were working on that we were going to like work with them on. And this guy, this Denver computer graphics designer guy in a plaid shirt with a big Denver beard who was six foot three. Like I, he like walked in and he had a tattoo that had like Elvish on. Like I literally fell out of the chair. Like, I just passed <laughs> out. Like they had to revive me. They had to bring in the smelling salts. Like I like that would have been my love actually moment. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not saying of course people see each other at, and are attracted hundred percent agree. Uh, we're in a cabinet meeting and we set up this idea of we're going to have a meeting with America and we have to play it right and we have to not get bullied. This is our first really important test. Let's take a stand. Right. Right. I understand that. But I have decided not to. I find this setup sort of weird that they're, that the prime minister is actually talking about how weak they are compared to I don't wouldn't think that's how a conversation would go in Great Britain. But that's just me. I found yeah. the setup odd. <laughs> but then he says, right, Who do you have to screw around here to get a cup of tea and a chocolate biscuit? And there's Natalie, which is great. And then later on, the two of them alone, she brings him stuff. He says, thanks a lot. And she says, I, um, I was hoping you'd win. Not that I wouldn't have been nice to the other bloke too, just always giving him the boring biscuits for no chocolate. Which is very cute <laughs> and very fun. Um, yeah, she's very she, much look for you talk about objectification. I know you, we're going to get into all the specifics, Steve, but you talk about objectification. I don't think that's the case here. She very much is herself. I agree through You're the right. whole movie and the exchanges, and he he's the one that has to come to her, you know. And so there's she's got power here, and and mm -hmm. and I think the I think this is the most successful of all of them because yes, yeah, so right. Michael brought up. Sorry, Steve. Michael brought up there a lot of them are, or and I think you said this too. Steve, a lot of the women are in subservient positions in terms of ranking and, and, and jobs or whatever. But in this case, she's very much her own person from the first moment cussing at the prime minister and then very much rolling with any of this uh, hard words or tough situations that she finds herself in. I think in power dynamics, uh, yeah. you know, from an outside, she is, the power dynamics are the most out of balance uh -huh. in this circumstance. But I also think she is the most of a character. Yeah. She yeah. has way more character than Kira Knightley or Aurelia. I mean, who I love, oh, yeah. but like, like they can't speak to each other. These characters can actually speak to each other. I'm starting to feel uh, uncomfortable about us working in such close proximity every day. And me knowing so little about you seems, uh, seems elitist and wrong. Well, it's not much to know. Well, um, where do you live, for instance? Wandsworth, the dodgy end. Ah, my sister lives in Wandsworth. Which is a key little plant. Um, <laughs> and then he says, which bosses really shouldn't do. And uh, you live with your husband, uh, boyfriend, three illegitimate but charming children. No, I've, um, I've just split up with my boyfriend, actually, so I'm back with my mum and dad for a while. Ah. Sorry. No, it's fine. I'm well shot of him. He said I was getting fat. And this is the beginning of the fat jokes about Natalie. He said no one's going to fancy a girl with thighs the size of big tree trunks. Which, I mean, to me, I think she's gorgeous. I don't understand. She is gorgeous. 
she like the, the, uh, this idea uh, that we're going to talk about her in this way is right. bizarre. Uh, but I, I do think the film is trying to point out that she's not the typical uh, wafer, as you see in all the other women in this movie. Yeah. Uh, she is a woman of, uh, you know, what can you say? She's just a, a, a woman of size, you would say. Yeah, so she's not your typical. And I think that's why I like that she's a, one of the main leads of the main one of the main romances in the movie. Sorry, well, it's interesting. Yeah, because like the Aurelia's sister at the end of the movie gets fat jokes. Like right, Aurelia's yeah. sister, those, those are straight up fat jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's happening with Natalie, I think John's kind of right. I think it's clumsy and doesn't work great. But she says in this scene that her ex-boyfriend called her fat. You're right. Um, the the one aide to the prime minister comes in later on and yeah. refers to her as fat in a horrible, horrible way. But yeah. but again, not in not they're not trying to make a joke at her expense. Like they're making a point that this woman is being really mean and fat shaming her. And then when he goes to her family at the end, her dad calls her plumpy. So it's like there is a thing here where she is supposed to be portrayed as this heavier person that Hugh Jackman still likes. Which I think Roca's right that it's like an attempt. Yeah. To do something positive, but I do not think the execution is very positive at all. It just comes comes across super weird. Yeah, um, I love the final moment after uh, David has said, "Well, I could get the SAS to kill your ex boyfriend," which is funny. Yeah. Uh, after she leaves, he looks up at the portrait of Margaret Thatcher and says, "You have this kind of problem?" <laughs> yeah, of course you did. You saucy mings. The president of the United States oh. is Billy Bob Thornton, yep. <laughs> who I think is great. Uh, in this uh and he shows up there's some jokes about his wife not making it and then he sees natalie and immediately yeah. s- makes a comment says goodness it's a pretty little son of a bitch right there did you see those pipes and that makes uh david uncomfortable and we have a meeting where essentially america is bullying great britain yeah. and all of the uh british cabinet Officers are looking at David to say something back, and he says, I don't think we're making progress here. Let's um, move on, shall we? We're alone with the two of them, and basically the President of the United States is saying, you're going to have to do what I want you to do. And David is buckling under because America is too powerful. And he has something he wants to show him. He walks out as Natalie is walking into the room, comes back, and when he comes back, Billy Bob Thornton is making moves on Natalie. Yeah. And the expression of fear on her face is real. Yeah. And there's looks between Hugh Grant and Billy Bob Thornton in the eyes. And you want to know what Richard Curtis describes this as? He describes it as his Sergio Leone moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that this is the two gunslingers (laughs) looking at each other. And we go to the press conference. And in the press conference, it is very clear that they're going to state the classic sort of we're going to work together and we're really good friends. And the president says we have a very special relationship. Mm. And Hugh Grant looks at the president and he sees Natalie in the crowd and he immediately changes the entire political direction of his country because he's (laughs) irritated that this guy came on to his, the girl he's attracted to. Right. And I think, and again, this is where I go like the scene is great. Yeah. Um, but it's also like, kind of goes, really? That's odd to me. I mean, in the world of a romantic comedy, that a hundred percent makes sense. And it's very, very satisfying. (laughs) Also in the world of love, actually, he was not going to tell the truth to the U S government about how great Britain was feeling, but then was pushed to the point where he stood up and told the truth and was rewarded for it. Yeah. And also this isn't about, Hey, you're hitting on my girl. He was sexually assaulting her. And so, yeah. This is not about, you know, the, that moment of like, oh, you're taking something from me. It's more like he was mad at him for doing this to another human being. And so hmm. he embarrassed him right there in that moment. And this guy is supposed to be, I think, an amalgamation of George Bush and uh, Clinton. So it's yeah. like it's that kind of shot taken at both of them, which I think is a, a great moment in the movie, to be honest with you. One of those glimpses into the... Hugh Grant we were going to see uh, years later as an actor. Like, there's a lot of levels he's playing here in these moments that I think are great. Well, and it's also related to Tony Blair, who, the British, many of them believe that he had been bullied by George W. Bush into the Iraq War when he shouldn't have. I love that word, relationship. Covers all manner of sins, doesn't it? I fear that this has become a bad relationship. 
a relationship based on the president taking exactly what he wants and casually ignoring all those things that really matter to um, Britain. I love the character that they created for David, the prime minister, which Mm -hmm. is this very funny, you know, part Hugh Grant kind of person. And by the way, this uh, was rewritten consistently right up until the last minute, this speech. We may be a small country, but we're a great one too. Country of Shakespeare, Churchill, the Beatles, Sean Connery, Harry Potter, (laughs) David Beckham's right foot, David Beckham's left foot come to that. And it was supposed to add Catherine Zeta-Jones's breasts. Whoa! And Hugh Grant continually refused to do it oh. and said, that's not right. The prime minister would never say this. Right. And finally, they just took it out. Good, good, good on Hugh Grant. That would have that not would been, uh, that would have not aged great. As opposed nope, to Catherine nope. Zeta-Jones, who has aged lovely. <laughs> Beautifully. <laughs> Well, and it's and it's a um, it's the wrong even even besides the not aging great, it's the wrong joke at the wrong moment. Yeah, like right, it just right. it would totally de- derail the yeah. uh, this whole thing. You're trying to give him the moral high ground, and objectifying a woman is not giving him the moral yeah. high ground in that moment. Yeah, uh, but the press loves it. They erupt. Billy Bob Thornton gives him a terrible, dirty ro- work look. He gets a call from his sister mm-hmm. uh, Karen, who's thrilled about it. And then later on, the all the whole nation is excited about it so much that the radio dedicates a song to him on the radio. And he alone at 10 Downing Street does a dance. <laughs> Hugh Grant, by the way, refused to re- rehearse this. He hated the whole idea. <laughs> it is so good, particularly the sort oh, of right. sliding to the side yeah. move as he goes across screen. It is <laughs> hilarious. And of course, at the end of his dance, after dancing down the stairs, there is a woman watching him from behind he immediately has to go into something about the japanese ambassador <laughs> it's super cute then a week later or so his assistant walks in I need you to do a favor for me of course anything for the hero of the hour don't ask me why and for heaven's sake don't read stuff into this it's just a weird personality thing but um you know natalie who works here and she says the chubby girl just horrible yeah and then <laughs> I think there's a pretty sizable ass there, yes, sir. Huge thighs. Uh, I don't even know what to say. It's like, <laughs> it's not. I, yes, people say mean things about each other, about other people, and that happens. But like the saying this to the prime minister in the office in Ten Downing Street, it just seems. Well, like, it's also apropos of nothing. And if you were going to go for the fact that Hugh Grant was attracted to Natalie despite the fact that she didn't fit into preconceived notions of what beauty was supposed to be, then at some point he needs to shut someone down. Like he needs to tell Annie, Hey, that's not cool. He needs to tell dad, Hey dad, don't call your daughter plumpy asshole. Like, but he never does. So it's just these things that just sort of fall out of people's mouths that don't push the story one way or the other. So it just seems like a shitty thing to say. Well, and not only does he never do it, But he does it at the end of the movie. He does the same thing. Right. Um, Yeah. So it's very weird. It it is. But again, I I will throw this in there. And and people can correct me if uh, who listen to us who are of the British uh, grew up. Like, is this something that is in the culture that is not necessarily meant to be offensive, but just something that is uh, uh, just said? And I don't know. And so we we sometimes can see things through the American perspective and we don't necessarily know with a British film like this if there are elements of that working here. I mean, that being said, looking at it from obviously from my point, I agree with both of you. It's way out of line, but I don't know uh, if that's something that is kind of talked about a little more freely or a little more playfully. I don't know. Well, I mean, again, I think that it's just there's a lack like, look, if you have if you are in love with someone who is mm. uh heavier or doesn't adhere to typical body Uh image issues and they don't have a problem with it and they're confident and you two can joke about it. That's a relationship that is a hundred percent allowed to exist, but it needs to be established in the proper way. And it's not established in a proper way here. It's just people say shit about Natalie. Natalie clearly feels bad about it because she felt bad about it when her ex-boyfriend said it. Mm -hmm. Um, But people are all making fun of her. David is not defending her. And if David said, like, for example, and I'm not sure that this would work either, but if David stood up to somebody and said, I think Natalie is beautiful, you saying this is shitty. And then at the end said, God, you weigh a lot. And she goes, oh, shut up. It almost makes it like he's saying, like, this is super okay. 
Wait, again, you, it wouldn't. It still okay. probably wouldn't land exactly right, but you need yeah. something more than what's there now. And so, right, Steve's right. It just kind of comes out as like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, but she doesn't. He get back at um, the assistant, doesn't he? No. Doesn't she? No. And doesn't no. he move her out of the no. job to someplace else? Nope. No. Okay. Nope. No, he I says he did. I nope. thought he did. no. Well, and th- and this is the thing too. Yeah. Is I think that Richard Curtis thinks these are funny jokes. It's not. Okay. There's no sense of judging people for making these jokes about Natalie. Right, right. That's not really in the movie. Yeah. It's these are funny. I'm sure she's a lovely girl, but I, I wonder if you could um, redistribute her. Which basically means move her out of the job at 10 Downing Street. Yeah. And Karen said, which I agree with, wish he'd said, she's great. This is not about, you know what I mean? Like, because mm. otherwise it really feels like she's being demoted for the fact that the president of the United States, as you said, John, assaulted her. Yeah. And now she's being kicked out of her job. That's yep. fucked up. Yeah. And that's exactly, it doesn't feel like that's what's happening. Right, right. That is what's happening. <laughs> Well, I think what David is doing is I am too attracted to my assistant and yeah. it's interfering with my work. That's what he's doing. Yeah. But to for Natalie, that's not how it's gonna feel. Right, right, exactly. He's working late. Uh, it's Christmas Eve. He gets a bunch of holiday cards in his briefcase. He's looking through the cards and finds one from Natalie that reads Dear Sir, dear David, Merry Christmas and I hope you have a very happy new year. I'm very sorry about the thing that happened. It was a very odd moment, and I feel like a prize idiot. Which is terrible and sad, because, of course, she did nothing wrong. Right. Um, But it's not unnatural for someone to feel like they did, even if they didn't. And she says... Particularly because, if you can't say it at Christmas, when can you, eh? I'm actually yours, with love. You're Natalie. I really like Natalie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think she's pretty awesome. And that's another on Christmas You Tell the Truth Mm -hmm. thing. Should we start doing this? I mean, Christmas is coming up. Maybe mm, <laughs> maybe we should have the airing of the grievances. I think we're good. <laughs> you, and it is true, by the way, none of these are negative truths. None of these are like, <laughs> I yeah. can't believe. Festivus is where you do the airing of the grievances. <laughs> Christmas is where you tell the truth. And look, and I do oh. think that the reason, again, that this works, even though this is not something that is remotely a Christmas tradition, is that Christmas is seen as a magical time of year. Mm-hmm. And I think when it comes to love and the way that we feel about people and us putting ourselves out there and being open and vulnerable and going out on a limb when it comes to telling someone you love them it's literally the scariest thing that you can do so kind of take marrying the two whether it was a just happy accident where someone was like why don't you make this a christmas movie or whatever well however it ended up happening kind of saying hey this is a time of year where you can put yourself out there a little bit and be vulnerable and Christmas has got your back. It's going to be okay. There, it is. It makes no sense from anything we know about Christmas, but there's something about it that's very appealing. I agree. <laughs> um, and so he goes. I need the car. He gets in his car. Wants to go to Wadsworth, the dodgy end. Um, and this, by the way, is the stupidest plan. <laughs> like, shows up on this huge street with no idea where her house is. And is he's the prime minister of England is just going to knock on every single door on Christmas Eve. <laughs> like this is like an insane plan. And uh, he knocks on one door, asks if Natalie's there. Uh, and then uh, he goes on the next door and two cute little girls answer and ask if they're singing carols. Well, I mean, I suppose I could. Please. All right. Breaks in a good King Wenceslas. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. His uh, security guy standing behind him <laughs> when he joins in. It's so is, good. It's so great. Yeah. When, when the, the snow lay round about, deep, deep and crisp and even. Hugh Jackman's. I mean, Hugh, now you may yes. yeah. Hugh Grant, Hugh Grant's, uh, Hugh Grant's sort of like the way his eyes sort of bulge before he turns, like the, his, his kind of like double take that he does is just perfection. It's absolute perfection. And the little girls like run dancing along as well. <laughs> yeah, they're because kids totally love dancing <laughs> to King Wenceslas. Yeah, that is exactly. a, that, my body starts moving when I hear that song too. Um, Goes to another door, a beautiful woman answers. He asks for Natalie, and she says he's next door. You're not who I think you are, are you? Yes, I'm afraid I am, and I'm sorry about all the cock-ups. Not my fault. My cabin is absolute crap. We have to do better next year. Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> Which a politician would probably never say that, but Hugh Grant is so charming. Hello. Hello. 
Oh. Ah, hello. Is uh, Natalie it? Oh, where the fuck is my fucking coat? Oh, hello. But they're all leaving to go to this Christmas concert. It is the first time all the local schools have joined together. Even St Basil. Too hundreds. much detail, Mum. Uh, anyway, uh, how can we help, sir? Well, I just needed Natalie on some state business. And finally, uh, he offers to drive them. So we see one car packed in the cop car just filled up. And then we have the great shot of the Prime Minister of England and Natalie separated by a kid in an octopus costume. <laughs> Look, I'm so sorry about that day. I mean, I came into the room and he sinked towards me and there was a fire and he's the President of the United States and nothing happened, I promise. And I just felt like such a fool because I think about you all the time, actually. And I think you're the man that I really... We're here! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that really was just around the corner. Uh, one thing I do wish, I wish he said the president was a horrible person and did something horrible because it's it's so much about her apologizing yeah right yeah. rather than no you were assaulted by an awful person and i like the, i like this too i like that david has the awareness to say i think i better not come in you know last thing anyone wants is some sleazy politician stealing the kids thunder and she goes just give me one second and she runs out she comes back and gets him. She says, I can take you backstage because this is her school. She knows all her way around. And as he's going in, he runs into his sister who gives him this really big and strange hug. We haven't been introduced. <laughs> oh, right. Um, this is Natalie, who's my, um, who's my uh, uh, catering manager. Oh, hi. <laughs> catering manager, watch out. He keeps his hands off you. 20 years ago, you'd have been just his type. I'll be very careful. Don't try something, sir, just because it's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I think what's great about Natalie is her confidence. Yes. Yeah. She knows he's. She knows what their relationship is. She's already confident in what's going on here. Yeah. Even though he hasn't actually said anything. They sneak backstage, and there's some girl who's singing a great song, and then all of a sudden, at the climax of the song, the curtains open up, just as they kiss, and there are a whole bunch of family members with their cameras seeing the Prime Minister of England kissing a girl backstage at the Christmas concert, and man, there is a lot of a reaction. So not quite as secret as we'd hoped. What do we do now? Smile. We'll bow. No way. It's a month later. He's David is coming back from some sort of political trip. Uh, there's news people. There's cameras flashing. And out of nowhere, Natalie runs through the crowd, jumps onto him. He catches her and says, God, you weigh a lot, <laughs> which I hate. I just really? hate it. Really? Oh, uh, I think well, if we cool. hadn't, if they had established something in their relationship, but to have had all these fat jokes and then have him kind of make a fat joke. No, he's not making crazy. a fat joke. It's a sweet. It's not a joke. It's like. Jesus, you sure are fat. He just, he says. Like, he's oh, making yeah. a comment on her weight. Yeah, but it's not a fat yeah. joke. There's a difference. I think you're he's actually, making a well, comment. I'm you're both a right. You're both right in that what they're going for is what John says. That's and what that is what they're going for. Moment. This is a cute, yeah. a cute thing butt. between them because they're both confident in their relationships. And she right. knows that David finds her attractive and like it's a cute thing between them. But Steve is right again in that because they never had a moment about it. The last, all that, all that David knows is. <laughs> All that David knows is, hey, your last boyfriend called you fat. And that was and, and you said he wasn't really a nice guy in the end. You know what you I'm maybe not going to do in much. the first month of our relationship? You need too much, Michael. It's all there. It's all there. You I mean, too, um, there are there are thousands of essays on the internets about this movie <laughs> that would disagree with you. <laughs> uh, um, but to me, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's all there because there's he's he genuinely attracted to her. He genuinely has feelings for her. And as I said, the Brits have kind of a ball busting thing. They have this kind of thing. And so I, I've i seen this happen and it's just part of it. So for me, I get the point of view, obviously, but I think that is not a, that's more of a playful, we have feelings for each other kind of joke, intimate joke that he says, whereas his assistant, that's horrific what she says. I think he's just me being a little more like intimately playful with her. I think that's um, true. No, I think it's a, I don't said, think that's she had said, yes, uh, old man or something or since it makes some joke about his age because there's the age difference that they're also have a thousand essays about in yeah, this yeah. Uh, relationship too 
I totally agree with Michael Vogel that you and I are both right because <laughs> because that is exactly what it is. It is yeah. a playful joke. That is what his intention is, and that is how she receives it. It right. does. It bugs me. It's not that that moment bugs me. It bugs me because of all the other moments mm -hmm. leading up to it. And as Michael said, there's not anything to set it up in a way that makes it feel better for me. Yeah. Let's meet Colin. Hello. Oh, fuck. Could, <laughs> Can't wait to hear so, this. Colin Frizzell, played by Chris Marshall. He works for a catering company. He's handing out some sandwiches at an oh, office party. Oh, we did party. with the storyline? Oh, let's get through this one quick. There's not much yeah. to talk about here. He's uh, serving at a reception for a wedding, sees this blonde, tries to flirt with her about insulting the food, says... What do you do, Nancy? I'm a cook. Ever do weddings? Yes, I do. I should have asked you to do this one. They did. God, I wish you hadn't turned it down. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. So here's what's funny. This scene is from a movie called Four Weddings and a Funeral. It was Hugh Grant's audition scene oh, for Four Weddings and a Funeral. They ended up, I think they shot it, cut it out of the movie, and then added it to this movie. <laughs> That's amazing. He goes into the back room with a friend and figure, and says he has the answer of why he can't tr find true love. English girl. They're stuck up, you see. And I am primarily attractive to girls who are, you know, cooler, game for a laugh, like American girls. Only go to America, he would totally get girls instantly because they'd love his cute British accent. Not so, a wrong theory. Not it's a not a wrong theory. Here's my only, it, I actually think the storyline, the this, this storyline is almost so shallow that it's great and amazing because it, it's not trying to be anything other than what it is. Yeah. I just wish he wasn't actually a dick. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, there's. Yeah, like, that's a good point. Like, like, he's actually a dick. Like, he's not, like, a good dude. He's kind of, like, a piece of shit. Like, the whole scene at the beginning with Nancy, the caterer, doesn't quite play as charming because he's just sort of gross and shallow and a bunch of things. And so if he was just a little bit more, like, he actually was a really dorky, awkward guy who just couldn't get, get it right, then what happens to him would have been even more satisfying. As it is, I'm kind of splitting hairs because it's still satisfying in the most ridiculous, shallow, over-the-top way. And there is something that is just, again, true about when you go out of your country, it happens if Americans go to Europe, it happens when Europeans come to America. You have an accent and you automatically go up two rungs on the attractive meter. Like, it just happens. Like, it's a weird thing and I've been the beneficiary of it when I have traveled and I am Ew. okay with it. And we go to him in uh, a van and he has bought a ticket to the States to a fantastic place called Wisconsin. No! Yes, Wisconsin babes! Here comes the Colin! No! <laughs> there are a few babes in America, I grant you. But they're already going out with rich, attractive guys. And I love, by the way, the back and forth of stateside. I am Prince William without the weird family. No, Colin. No. Yes. Net. Da. Nine. Yeah, darling. All of that is really funny. It's a week before Christmas. He's rent out his flat to buy his ticket to Wisconsin. We get to the airport. He claims to have a backpack full of uh, condoms. As right before he gets in the plane, he makes the announcement. America, watch out. Here comes Colin Frizzle, and he's got a big knob. <laughs> I mean, <sighs> arrives at Milwaukee, asked to be taken to a bar, just an average American bar. He gets taken to an average American bar, <laughs> orders a Budweiser, the king of beer, and immediately a beautiful woman, <laughs> Shannon Elizabeth from American Pie, <laughs> hears his accent, thinks he's cute, calls over her blonde friend, January Jones, also loves his accent. Carol Ann really likes English accents. That's Alicia Cuthbert. So three unbelievably hot women completely obsessed with him just for opening his mouth. Why don't you come back and sleep at our place? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, it's not too much of an inconvenience. Hell no. Uh, but there's one problem. What? Well, we're not the richest of girls, you know, so we just have a little bed and no couch oh. so you would have to share with all three of us yeah. and on this cold cold night it's gonna be crowded and sweaty and stuff yeah and we can't even afford pajamas no. which means we would be naked <laughs> so <laughs> this is a this is this is a porn right i mean this is pornography i mean like that this is the exact script <laughs> from a porn i 
<laughs> I've heard it differently, and I've not. I'm not the one that said this. I've, 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 I've heard other people say it, so I can't take credit for it. But somebody told me that this storyline is this is what happens if a straight person gets to live one night as a gay man. <laughs> <laughs> this is like this. This this whole sequence plays out in a way that you're like, this is so unrealistic. This would never happen. This is the most insane, over the top. And I think as like completely weirdly sexist and objectifying as this whole storyline is, it's almost like it's pushed so far beyond the boundaries of reality into parody that it actually kind of works. But then somebody was like, yeah, but if like that was a gay guy, I'm like, oh yeah, no, that actually completely makes sense. That actually would work. That actually doesn't even seem weird anymore. It just seems like that's actually what would happen. Uh, and then if this isn't enough, they say... The thing that's going to make it more crowded? Uh, Harriet. Oh, you Harriet. haven't met Harriet. It's a false one. Yeah. yeah. Don't worry, you're totally going to like her because she is the sexy one. <laughs> and then we cut to this sh- house in the snow with four figures in a silhouetted window obviously doing naughty things and a woman strange enough like in high heels and i think a miniskirt walking through the snows of wisconsin <laughs> towards this house and i'm watching this and literally my note was like well is this real like this does this am i supposed to think that this in the movie with the laura linney and the emma thompson story that this also happens <laughs> like it's so completely bizarre but like i mean i remember even seeing it when we saw it in theaters like people were like losing it like it's just so <laughs> over the top and it's so silly and i also think that there is a little bit i think there is truth to this like when you go out of your when you go out of your country to another country there is this like you are you are interesting to people in a different way but i also think this is a little bit what British people think America is like. I think that there is kind of a, yeah, that's what it's like in America, isn't it? Uh, One month later, Tony picks up his friend Colin at the airport, assuming that Colin has totally had a horrible time in the U.S. Out comes Shannon uh, Elizabeth. Tony is shocked. I hope you don't mind. I sort of brought my sister to stay. And there is Denise Richards. This is Carla. She's real friendly. (laughs) Hello, you must be Tony. Gives him a big kiss. I you were gorgeous. <laughs> All right, so that's that film. Yeah, it, please. I, I don't have nothing to say on this. Yeah, you have nothing to say. You know you love it. No, it's te- what? No you way. Love it. You that dude's love not attractive. It. Why do you think I would love that? I, I, I would love to hear why you think I would love this. It's such a dumb storyline. I. But that's what I love about it. I. It is funny. <laughs> it is. It is so it stupid. Nothing. It is so stupid. And I do wish, like I said at the beginning of it, that I wish he was a little bit uh, not as much of a dick because I don't think he actually gets what he deserves. But it is just like this. Hey, sometimes love just works out in weird ways, guys. But this is to the Lady Outlaws point. This is as objectifying. That is absolutely objectifying. So now we get to go from the most ridiculous and over the top <laughs> story in love actually to what arguably is the heaviest and most difficult story of love actually. Well, actually it's kind of a tie, but right now we're going to meet Emma Thompson and Alan Rickman in the story of their marriage. Yeah. Whew. I just got to say, I looked, I just looked at all this stuff again because we've taken a break since we recorded some of the other ones and it really wrecks me. It really does. Well, it's an honest tale isn't it it's an honor it's you know we, we talked about all the love actually stuff all the sweet touchy-feely moments and some of the cringy moments but this is when it gets real right yeah. i mean and the emma tom i mean how many people are in relationships or marriages because of the kids deal with the cheating deal with the nonsense of it all because there is a bigger perspective that they have whether it's right or wrong that i suppose you can judge it but I love that they threw this element in the movie and really make Alan Rickman a jerk off for sure. In contrast to Emma uh, Emma Thompson's strength and style, I almost said Emma Five Emma Thompson's strength and style in the role here uh, in Love Action. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, as we've been talking about with like each of these stories, like there's an element of what what Richard Curtis added to Christmas, which is this idea of telling the truth. And this is a story where there's a serious lack of truth being told and it has the saddest ending. So uh, yeah. I have some issues with the way it ends, but yeah, I think this is definitely the heart of the heart of the movie. I mean, as much as we talk about like the, the card scene and dropping the cards as like the iconic moment, um, Emma Thompson standing alone in her bedroom, um, listening oh. to Joni Mitchell is probably the most heartbreaking thing 
in almost any Christmas movie and uh, and really hits hard because Emma Thompson is is bringing the heat with with this role. Yeah, she she really is. And we start off with her and her daughter, who has an exciting, wonderful announcement. We've been given our parts in the nativity play <gasps> and I'm the lobster. The lobster? Yeah. Who knew there was a lobster in the nativity play? Second, yeah, yeah, yeah. Se- uh, is it second lobster? There was, there was more than one lobster. Yes, it was the birth of Jesus. Lobster. What's so great, and, and it's funny, you, uh, Michael, I don't know if you remember when we recorded part one, we had a brief glimpse of Emma Thompson as she talks to her friend Daniel, who's going through some losses. And you had said that the thing about her, she's always telling the truth. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I don't think she is. And this is one example. She's, her job is to be super excited that her kid is the second lobster in the t- nativity play. Mm-hmm. And I think we're going to see her do what is necessary throughout this film but not always the truth interesting i i can see that i think that makes sense i think i think when we see her but but like you know when we see her with daniel in those scenes in his story you know Mm. she is being more honest than a person normally would when someone is grieving and i think maybe there's something to that like in that relationship she's saying things that most people wouldn't say she's being sort of like bluntly honest uh, which is probably what, to your point, what maybe is necessary for Daniel. That's what he needs. But then in her own life, even with something silly like I'm the lobster in the nativity play or as other things go on, there is this sort of like uh, more doing what's necessary than what's true. I think that's a good point. It's interesting. This is this is maybe the one of the few places where I think these separate movies are really connected. Like a lot of them, they were just kind of passed in and out of each other's worlds. Mm. But what you said is really interesting. I think her relationship with Daniel is a far more honest relationship than some of the other ones she has in her life. Um, And we cut to her husband, Mm. uh, Harry, played by Alan Rickman, as he is talking to his new assistant, Mia, who's played by Heike Makatish. I don't know how to pronounce that name. Mm. Um, And she tells him that, you know, that one of his employees is coming in. And then there's this odd moment where he awkwardly asks, Settling him fine, letting you to avoid? Absolutely. And there's just the hint of a, is something going on here? Hmm. It's a week or two later, and apparently it's Mia's job to plan the Christmas party. He gives what his instructions are, find a venue, order the drinks, buy the guacamole. I love this line. Advise the girls to avoid Kevin if they want their breasts unfundled. Oh, I'm glad that Kevin doesn't suffer any repercussions for this <laughs> obvious exactly knowledge. What I was thinking, <laughs> like, okay, so there is a clear sexual harasser in your office. Yeah, and then we hear that it's wives and family and stuff, not children, wives and girlfriends, and uh, and then he says, "It's so funny because this is almost exactly what David, the Prime Minister, said to Natalie." Christ, you haven't got some horrible six foot tight t shirt wearing boyfriend you'll be bringing here. It's not the same line. But it is a boss talking to his assistant as, you know, not so subtly trying to find out if they have a boyfriend. One of the big differences is Harry's married. Yeah. Yeah. And man, Mia's response, and we're going to have to talk about Mia. No, I'd just be hanging around the mistletoe, hoping to be kissed. Mia's interesting because Mia is basically a Mm non-character. Like Mia has literally nothing to her personality except I want to have sex with my boss. Like, there's really not a lot. Like, we don't know why she wants to have sex with her boss. Like, we don't know right. what's going on with her. She is literally there to be, I am a temptation. And there's not much else going on, really. And he, and she doesn't want to have sex with homie who's going to America. Whatever. His right. Name well, yeah. Is. Well, nobody wants to have sex with no, him okay. unless, you're, unless you're in Wisconsin, apparently. Uh, yeah, apparently. Well, <laughs> I mean, in a weird way, she's as shallow a character as those characters in Wisconsin. I mean, it's played mm. in a much more serious movie, but she's... Yeah just as openly flirtatious for zero connection. And again, it's this case where in the, you know, where we have attraction without actual relationship, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, it's a week later, he checks in on the Christmas party and she's gotten an art gallery, which she describes as full of dark corners full, doing dark deeds. And then she spreads her legs very noticeably for Alan Rickman to see. Good, well, I suppose I should take a look at it or something. 
you should. It's definite double entendre there. Yeah, the whole thing, it's so funny as much as, and this is, I knew it would happen as we sort of dive in. Like, I love Love Actually, as I've said many times. But when you start scratching below the surface on some of these stories, you're like, ugh. Yeah. This uh, I don't like, and not even not even like the reasons that you're not supposed to like it. Like obviously, we're not supposed to like uh, a married man kind of being tempted by his assistant. But also, like just again, like the the Mia of it all, like the fact that it's so shallow, kind of just feels icky to me. But it's again, but it's, I think it's also uh, you know in defense of the movie, I think it's interesting to portray all the different aspects of Christmas and the different people involved at Christmas. You know, we get so caught up with the whole let's hug each other around the Christmas tree type of aspect, but there are people who are pretty shallow and uh, pretty and use those moments uh, at Christmas parties or at Christmas events to kind of shoot their shots, so to speak. And we certainly see that in Mia, uh, even though I think you're 100% right, Michael, she's a shallow character. There's not much to her. We don't see her inner working life. She has another scene with the prime minister where he knocks on the door and says, you know, Natalie's over there, but she also kind of sits in for these kind of vacuous people that we see at Christmas parties or these lonely people that have to take what someone else has at Christmas to make themselves feel better. So in that way, there is a little bit of representation of that small piece of the pie in the world, which I think is is a good thing, actually. I agree with what both of you said. And what's interesting to me about it, about the way they create the Mia character, isn't so much for me what it says about Mia. It's what it says about Harry. Right. Is that he doesn't actually have much of a character other than he's kind of distracted and not paying very much attention to his wife. It's sort of, he's kind of a cliche. You know, the mo- the most interesting moments you have where he really shows character is him with Sarah. Yeah. With Laura That's Laura. when he's like really interesting. Yeah. And makes unusual choices, but he doesn't really make a lot of choices other than the main one that's going to get is going to be really hurtful and have lots of consequences. But right. but I also think but I also think that's why casting is so important in films like this. Totally, 100%. right? He's on so you want to have someone who's immediately interesting and charming because of their natural energy, because the of the resume they already have. So when you're watching them, you're immediately like, okay, I, I, I'm in on this person because it's Alan Rickman, or I'm in on this person because it's Laura Linney. You know, you just like 100% or Emma Thompson. You're just dialed in, and maybe they, they may not get as much screen time to develop a really nuanced, layered character, but they're going to be there to give the broad brush strokes, and the broad brush strokes are enough to keep you interested. So you have to be smart in how you cast these films as opposed to Gary Marshall casting these. Films. I think that is such a great point. And it's so, and, and may, and I think it might be, I mean, all these actors are really good, mm. but I think you're right. It might be most noticeable with Alan Rickman because yeah. he has the least to do in some ways. And he brings all of his Alan Rickman ness. So every moment he's on screen is interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, it ends up that Karen's brother is the prime minister of England <laughs> who has just uh, stood up to the president of the United States. She gives him a call, super proud of him. He gets off the phone and she turns to her husband and says, The trouble with being the prime minister's sister is it does put your life into rather harsh perspective. What did my brother do today? He stood up and fought for his country. And what did I do? I made a papier-mâché lobster head. <laughs> and we hear that the music we're listening to is Joni Mitchell. And Harry's line here is like, it's insensitive on like three levels. I can't believe you still listen to Joni Mitchell. So A, he didn't recognize that it was Joni Mitchell. B, he, he thinks she should have grown out of Joni Mitchell. And C, he actually calls it, you feel like, He's probably said this 20 times, don't you? Maybe. I don't think, I mean, I, again, I think like back to the casting thing, I think that if it was a different person, I probably would take a lot of the things that Harry says way harsher, but because it's Alan Rickman, I'm kind of like, oh yeah, that's kind of a sweet curmudgeon thing to say. But yeah, I, sure. I it, you're not wrong. It just never quite struck me as that. In retrospect, you see the connection, right? Because they obviously have issues with each other. So when... He says what he says now, and after you've seen the movie, it can really be seen as a biting shot, and clearly this guy's not happy in this marriage, so he's going to take his passive-aggressive shots where he can find them, unfortunately. I don't know that I agree. Like, I mean, okay. clearly he's tempted, but like, I don't think that these are two people that are unhappy in their marriage or that he, they're taking shots at each other. Like, I think that really? that's why okay. I think that's why Emma Thompson is so blindsided by what happens. I don't think that she thinks 
there's anything wrong with their marriage. I think she, it's, I think when at the, at the Christmas party, when she sees Mia, she definitely goes on alert and says something to Harry, which we'll get right, to in a right. minute. But, and with Harry, I don't think that in any scene, are we led by the writing or what's happening to go, this is a man who's miserable or doesn't like his wife or doesn't anything like everything is just, he see he seems bored by it for mm. sure as things move forward. But I don't think that this is two people that are like, catty with each other or being shitty to each other um because i think then the ending wouldn't feel as sad as it does fair i i i saw so many face i have an opinion on this but i saw so many facial expressions on john's face <laughs> as michael i want to hear do you have do you have a, something else you wanted to say about this before i offer my opinion <laughs> No, I, I think Michael makes an interesting point. And as we go along talking about this uh, relationship, um, I'm going to digest it as we go along and see the point. Because, I mean, when you're in a bad relationship or you're in a relationship, uh, bored is a, actually, I didn't think about that one, Michael. So bored. So maybe you're taking those shots because it doesn't really matter to you because you're so bored. It doesn't you don't think that that's kind of a biting shot, especially if you understand how important that person's work is as a singer to that person's life. Do you know what I'm saying? And I wonder if that's something that maybe he knows. So he's taking just a quick little shot as he goes along and he thinks he can because she won't go anywhere and he's confident in the relationship. But I, I imagine she's aware that there are issues in that relationship. And women always know quicker than men do, no matter what they say. Women are much more intuitive than men are about this kind of shit. And For sure. Women, women always I think, say that stuff. I think real quick, Steve, before you weigh in, I think that, what this story to me, and again, I think like a lot of these are open to interpretation, but I yeah, think yeah. what this story represents to me is that issue. It's not the issue of what happens when you have a marriage that has trouble, um, which is definitely a story and that is a worthy story to be told. And a lot of marriages do. I think this is a story about what happens when a marriage just settles. I think this is, this oh, is not the okay. I'm unhappy. This is the, we had kids. Our life is our life. We mm -hmm. do school plays. We send presents to our friends. We do our Christmas right. shopping together. Like right. it's very everything. You can tell they've done all of this uh, for a long time. And Harry's uh, temptation is not the temptation of, oh, I hate my marriage. I want out. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, this is the same. And here's this other thing that's really different, new and exciting um, and younger and, uh, you know, uh, superficially very attractive. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, it's more of the, boredom than it is any kind of like which which by the way is is, is its own kind of issue in a marriage for sure <laughs> yeah. so i'm not saying that their marriage is like a perfect marriage but yeah. i don't think that it's a miserable marriage or anything like that and i think emma thompson is kind of okay with where they're at i really agree with that and i, and I would add one thing to it which is i think they are in slightly different places i think mm. they have settled in i think their marriage works in many 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 ways in you know works financially, works as parenting, works yeah. as how they do everything. They know how they do everything with each other. They have their patterns. They're all locked in. Here's what I see as the key difference is I think Emma Thompson's character has accepted that that is how it's supposed to be. There are things I'm never going to get. It's not going to be romantic and exciting, but this is what it's supposed to be. And it's okay. Right. And I'll listen to my Joni Mitchell and that'll be fine. And I think Harry Alan Rickman has not. And I think he is at a moment in his life where he's going, is this all I get? Yeah, and he's probably fooled himself that he's the one that has made all the compromises in the marriage as opposed to Emma Thompson's character. And she's probably, you know, kind of bent over backwards to make him more comfortable in the marriage. And he doesn't even realize that. So, yeah, it, two different places for any number of reasons, for sure. Well, and I think in that respect, you get to like the whole truth thing that you were saying, Steve, which I think you're right. You're more right than I was about Emma Thompson, because these are two people that are in different places. And if they were able to be open with each other and talk about that, mm. maybe their marriage could be stronger, but they're both dealing with it in their own way. And Emma Thompson is dealing with it by being like, well, this is as good as it gets. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to bring anything up. And Harry is clearly not being honest because he's dealing with Mia. So it's two people not telling the truth at Christmas. And I think this line is just key to everything. These two lines, really. I love her. And true love lasts a lifetime. But Joni Mitchell is the woman who taught your cold English wife how to feel. <laughs> Let's just take a moment with that line first. Um, first of all, true love lasts a lifetime. I think she has more feelings of true love for Joni Mitchell than she does for her husband. 
deep down. I don't know that she would admit it to herself. Mm. And the second thing is, who taught your cold English wife how to feel? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that she was ever cold. Well, uh, the Brits are not known for being that open with their emotions sure. within the culture. So she's it could also be like a self-effacing thing that she's saying a little bit. And maybe he, um, who doesn't come off that warm himself, maybe he's occasionally made the crack that she's, you know, not as open or a little cold or a little distant or aloof or whatever in the past. Well, I mean, we do. I mean, we, we it is established right off the top, as we said, that she is blunt. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in an emotional situation. And so the bluntness that she exhibits, plus her saying, you know, your cold British wife, like, I do think there is probably a level of she's a, you know, she's, she's a, she's tough. She's a tough one. (laughs) And then Harry's response. Did she? Oh, well, that's good. I was right to her sometimes and say thanks. Is so, I don't know, flat, (laughs) sort of like, I don't know how he feels about it. But there's a lot in there. Yeah, I can I, I just again, I think this guy's taking his passive aggressive shots where he can find them. Yeah, I think that one certainly is weird. Yeah, I think if it wasn't Alan Rickman, I think like he kind of mm. has this way of delivering the lines where you're like, I I feel like this is okay. But then when you like <laughs> like I'm thinking about when as you're saying it, I'm kind of looking at I'm th- I'm picturing the lines on like a page of a script. <laughs> and like that response, oh, I should I, I shall have to write her and say thank you. I'm like, mm. <laughs> what, what do you that? mean? What, what are you saying right now? <laughs> uh, we're at a holiday party. Karen is at her husband's office. He's the boss of the party. And the first thing she says is, I suppose I should go and do the duty rounds. See, this is where I go. I think her whole character is like a huge part of her that isn't being blunt with Daniel and has this tremendous, uh, wonderful, honest side is like, this is the role I have to play and I'm going to go play it. Yeah. Uh, um, And Alan Rickman says, you're a saint. And what is Mia wearing at the party as Alan Rickman walks away from his saint wife? Devil horns. Mm. It's subtle. It's subtle, guys. (laughs) It's very subtle. And I'm also like, it's a Christmas party. It's not like, why are you wearing devil horns? Any chance of a dance with the boss? And then he dances with Mia clearly in the Feel full view of his wife. You're looking very pretty tonight. It's for you. Sorry. It's all for you, sir. Man, Mia is just. Even though the Colin Wisconsin thing is a comedy, it's liter. It's the same thing. Yeah. And the line, by the way, it's all for you, sir. Hmm. The sir, well, <laughs> the, the, the note I wrote at this moment is she has a real problem. <laughs> she she has a real problem, but also this is one of the big uh, complaints about love actually is the uh, the number of storylines that deal with a woman in a subservient position yeah. and a man in a uh, position of authority, whether that be prime minister, boss, uh, you know, a uh, man who hires housekeeper and how so many of these stories deal with a and not in some some with happy endings some with not unhappy endings but many of them with oh man in authority position woman in subservient position isn't this romantic and it's like uh, this is a thing that richard curtis is working through yeah. well and and it's a, most of them are attraction with very little actual communication right you know mm-hmm. like david and natalie they have the most sort of and they have instant chemistry i think yeah, yeah. and so that's the one that sort of feels the best mia is like it's all very uncomfortable to me. Mm-hmm. And then we're with Karen and Sarah, Emma Thompson and Laura Linney, and they're both watching him dance with Mia. Yeah. And Sarah tries, you could see her trying to soften the blow by saying, I suppose it's his job to dance with everyone. Yeah. A, w- a woman taking care of another woman in that situation. Do you know what I'm saying? And that's, she's doing her best. Karen's reply. Some more than others. Mm-hmm. So she knows. She knows. Well, she I mean, you can't it. not know at this point. Well, my question is, so what's the past like? Yeah, I think he's done this before. I think he's absolutely flirted with a younger woman or a different woman before, and then it's gone away. And she's kind of dealt with it and navigated it because of the kids. I've gone back and forth. There are different levels. So one level mm-hmm. is he has always been totally respectful of all other women in his life and never, ever even thinks of straying. 
Another level is he could be flirtatious with, you know, pretty women who work at his office, but never really, none of it was serious. Another level is he was seriously flirting, but it never went anywhere. And another level is he's had multiple affairs in the past. So I feel like, and again, uh, I could, could be, could go either way on this. I don't feel strongly one way or the other, but mm. I, Alan, I love Alan Rickman. Anyone who loves Alan Rickman, don't get mad at me for what I'm about to say. He's not the most handsome of men. Like yeah. he's handsome because he's Alan Rickman and we love him I'm and his talent. May, I know I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but, but he's not, it's not like he's like this stud of a boss who uh, Emma Thompson has to be worried because her super hot husband is getting hit on all the time. Like, I think what is happening here is here's a guy who's been married and, you know, he and his wife are both, you know, older and settled and whatever. And all of a sudden this super hot girl who is a thousand times out of his league shows serious interest in him and rather than me thinking that this is like a pattern of behavior that he's done a thousand times and emma thompson has dealt with this i kind of feel like this is like he's as shocked as anybody but that's what makes it so that's what makes him like well this is my last shot i'm gonna do this thing i'm gonna go after this woman um because if he did it all the time there that's a slightly different story i think this is a guy you know and I'm not sympathetic to him per se, but this is a guy struggling with how he's not happy in his marriage. And all of a sudden this thing happens that he thought he was way past the ability to ever get someone like this, which makes it all the more temptation, uh, mm. tempting for him to do it. I agree with that. And that, that's kind of my gut too, about, about what the situation is. Mm. Um, we're back home. It's after the party. The first thing Emma Thompson says is I feel fat. Which, by the way, she had to wear that she's actually wearing a fat suit because Emma Thompson's quite skinny. I mean, not like a a huge, you know, nutty professor fat suit, but like she's <laughs> a couple of extra so layers. <laughs> and then the next thing that Emma Thompson says, "Me is very pretty." Is she, <laughs> dude? <laughs> you can't not like you have. We know that you saw it. You know she is, darling. Be careful there. That line has always struck me in that moment. Like I said, I wonder if this is something that has happened before. And her saying, be careful there, is because maybe she's had to navigate him falling in love with these younger women or uh, unattainable women or whatever. And he ha she's had to nurse him back to her, which is a very unsettling relationship to consider or ponder. Um, but... Be careful there is an interesting warning from a woman who is married to him. Is she warning him like you could lose everything if you make this decision? Or is she saying uh, you've done this before and uh, you might get your heart broken yet again and I'm going to have to nurse you back out of this? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have a very, I have a very strong opinion. This is so. This is what I. This is what okay. I think. And of course, we don't know because right, none right. of this is in the film. Which but is what I think is that he has in the past always been a little flirtatious with people that he worked with. Mm -hmm. And what I think Emma Thompson for me is saying here is your normal flirtation. Don't do it with this person. This person is different. Mm. Like it's going to go to a, this is more, you don't, maybe you don't know, but yeah. this is, I could tell this is a more serious thing. That's kind of how I see it. I, the other thing that I want to say about this scene, cause I think it's great is that when John and I were in college uh, and went to study abroad together in London, we had this Shakespeare teacher who we would do the, they, they, they would, when we were in uh, regular classes at Florida state, if you did a Shakespeare scene, you would do an entire, like, you know, five page, six page scene and work on it. And this Shakespeare, uh, uh, London Shakespeare uh, person, our teacher, Selena Caldell would only let us do four lines each. Mm -hmm. Like that was the most we could do because she was like, that's enough. We're going to break down all of your habits and your bad acting and whatever. And we would have to focus on like each of us would have four lines <laughs> and that's all you got to work on. And you had to make those really work, whatever the scene was. Uh, and every time I watch this scene, which is a really short scene, mm -hmm. but it's Emma Thompson and Alan Rickman just saying kind of almost inane stuff until you get to the Mia stuff. And everything is packed with so much meaning. Like this mm -hmm. is just watching two a plus actors who were just at the top of their game doing something where this scene with just two kind of mediocre actors would have been like, eh. but like you are just like on the edge of your seat with these two as they're just getting ready for bed, which I think is great. And then we cut to, and I, this is a weird cut in the movie for me is you cut to Mia undressing and a very sexy shot. And it's like, if you had been on Alan Rickman, 
and then cut to this, then you could go, oh, he's thinking about her, fantasizing about her. If you've been on Emma Thompson, you could go, oh, she's thinking about her. But that isn't quite how it works out. It just feels like the director showing you, here is this hot person, you know? Right. Which I, wasn't, it wasn't a place in the early 2000s. That wasn't out of place for us to put that in movies and ogle at women and whatever. It was, not to say that it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it wasn't out of place. It does seem odd now in 2021 to look at that scene and be like, why is that even in there? Why did we need to see that? And clearly that might have been the producer, Richard Curtis, saying, you know what? Let's give these guys a little something to watch. I don't know. I always, I always took it as we see Emma Thompson and Alan Rickman getting ready for bed together. And again, it's very, you can oh. tell they've done this a thousand times. They're getting ready for bed. They are together. They're, it's, they're, their room is comfortable. Their bed looks really nice. And then you cut to Mia in this very weird room undressing and she's alone and it's kind of cold and it's kind of like, it just, oh, it yeah, doesn't look appealing. It doesn't look right. like an appealing place to be. And it's like, Harry's living this fantasy of what he could have. But then when you see this contrast, you see this very like comfortable uh, I- image of a marriage. And then you see this very cold, lonely thing that uh, a thing being the situation, not Mia. But you see this very cold moment in this cold room with this woman who doesn't really seem like there's a lot there. And that can connect to the line she had, uh, Michael, as well, where she says, be careful there because there's danger there. And even more shallowness or hollowness mm-hmm. of a person there. That's a great point. We're back at the office. Christmas shopping, never an easy or a pleasant task. Are you going to get me something? Uh, I don't know, I hadn't thought. And he's outside the office and immediately calls back to his assistant on the phone. And this is, I would say, this is his first move. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like she's been flirting with him and making advances on him. When you call back and the first thing you say is, So you're going to give me something? Well, now we're into a whole other level. I thought I made it clear last night. When it comes to me, you can have everything. Looking at these lines just isolated, it just seems to get worse and worse how shallow a character she is. Yeah. And then you have Alan Rickman delivering a line that only he can, in the way only he can de- deliver it. So what do you need? Something in the stationary line? You short of <laughs> staples? <laughs> it's very, it's very snapish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, 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 he has, he has just a wonderful delivery, and he hangs up the phone because there is Emma Thompson because he's going off to shop with his wife. Yeah. And we arrive at Selfridges, uh, which is you know obviously one of the most f- fanciest, biggest department stores in the world, and they can't shut this store down. So this is all shot in the middle of the night. And a lot of it, like when you get to the Ron Atkinson stuff, it's like at five in the morning. <laughs> and basically, Emma Thompson says... Right. Well, listen, you keep yourself occupied for 10 minutes while I go and do the boring stuff for our mothers. And it's like, what? what's he doing here? Like, like he, she has taken so much of the responsibility, it seems, of family and parenting, you know. And he is alone. He looks around, sees a jewelry case, sees a piece of jewelry... And there is Rowan Atkinson. And this scene is, what's so funny, it's so odd and so out of place. And because he is so damn good and Alan Rickman is so good at reacting, it is hilarious. Yeah, it's it's a weird, and again, like, kind of to what we were talking about with the other storyline where, like, is Rowan Atkinson supposed to be some sort of supernatural Christmas thing or is he just a dude? <laughs> Uh, and like we said, I think originally he was supposed to be more. It does seem like if he were a Christmas spirit, he is basically trying to prevent Harry from going down a really bad road. Oh, but as it ends oh. up, yeah. but as it ends up playing, he's just the most annoying guy that works at a store of all time. <laughs> um, and we see he says that he's going to buy this 270 pound necklace, which is an expensive necklace. I don't know what the exchange rate in 2003 was, but that seems like a lot of money. And, and this is the first thing I'm like, dude, your wife is in the store like you're a moron. And then he uh, Rowan Atkinson asks, would you like it gift wrapped? Apparently for Rowan to do this whole bit was seven minutes long. <laughs> That's how long it took him to do all this stuff. Look, could we be quite quick? Certainly, sir. Ready in the flashiest of flashes. And Alan Rickman, at five in the morning, had to sit and react for seven minutes. And some of these are improvised lines. Could we be quite quick, please? Brontissimo. 
it goes on and on. He, you know, he pulls out. There's the bow, and no, it's not finished. And then another bag, and then there's this a scoop of like rose petals or something, and cinnamon, and every little detail. <laughs> Rogue Atkinson is just puts so much into it as Alan Rickman gets more and more uncomfortable. Almost finished. Almost finished. What else can that be? You're gonna dip it in yogurt. Cover it with chocolate buttons. And then he puts on the glove. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. I mean, Atkinson is such a great physical comedian. And to, to, to play this thing out as long as he does, I think Mike, you make an excellent point. I've never, ever thought of if he is supposed to be that supernatural thing. The fact that he's dragging this out is giving him more time, uh, Alan Rickman's character, to reconsider the situation. And the frustration on Rickman's face is all about getting caught. So he knows right. he's doing something wrong. Yeah. So the fact that he's dragging this out is kind of heightening the tension here that he's going to get caught. I always mirror this or um, think of this scene and juxtapose it to the scene with Chevy Chase in Christmas Vacation when he's getting the lingerie for his or supposedly for his wife from that from that woman behind the mm. counter. Like the it's interesting to watch both of those scenes back to back. I think they're hilarious. Or even Eugene Levy in Serendipity when he's messing around with that counter stuff <laughs> as well. So to me, it's all very interesting what he does here. But of course, it's to heighten the tension, heighten the fear. And you're right to say he's kind of an idiot for doing this while he's out with his wife. He could go on his own. But the fact that he's doing it right under his wife's nose when she's out there buying Christmas presents, probably for the kids or for their friends, so he doesn't have to deal with that nonsense uh, um, because it irritates him, saying from his point of view, it's really cruel of him to do this while they're there as she's doing something as a favor for him. It's nuts. It's ridiculous. And just at the end, up comes Emma Thompson, who's shocked to have found him in the jewelry section. <laughs> I was just looking Don't around. Worry. My expectations are not that high after 13 years of Mr. Oh, but you always love scarves. <laughs> Which is a really sad line. I mean, most of Emma Thompson's lines are really sad. It is, we'll get to the end of this, but this is where I have like my issue with love actually being that Emma and Sarah, just uh, Emma, uh, Karen and Sarah, I guess, have just like the shittiest endings in this mm. movie. It's mm. truly shitty. Uh, it's later on, Harry comes home late <laughs> and he walks away and she looks in his pocket of his jacket, which he's left hanging, pulls out a jewelry box and there sees the necklace that he, we know he has bought for Mia. And Emma Thompson's facial expression as she turns away is so adorable <laughs> when she knows that she's going to get this amazing gift. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she checks later on, and under the tree is a box that's exactly the same size box as, or a wrap package exactly the same size as the box with the jewelry. And it says, sorry, I'm such a grumpy bugger. And she smiles and she's so excited. And we you could feel the oncoming train wreck, you yep. know? Yeah, yeah. And it's Christmas Eve. We're opening presents. And she is so excited. She jumps in front of the kids <laughs> to open her present. And Alan Rickman, thinking that he is being very clever, says, I have, of course, bought the traditional scarf as well. But this is my other slightly special personal one. And she kisses him first before opening it and says, thank you. And opens it up and it is a Joni Mitchell CD. Mm. Which, mm. which the tragedy of this is in the absence of a Mia, in the absence of that mm. entire storyline, this is actually, gift? this is a good gift. Like yeah, it is a, true. there was a, they had a moment. They talked about Joni Mitchell. She was like, I love her so much. He was like, my my wife loves Joni Mitchell. I got her a Joni Mitchell CD. Like yeah. it is actually a good gift. It's just not, the other gift and it's like it's it's like if he had just gotten her scarves or something it would have been just super shitty but it's that it's that balance of like you did sort of a good job as a husband yeah in the absence yeah. of the fact that you're a super shitty husband yes that is exactly right and i had to say emma thompson's performance from this point forward Ooh. in the movie is astounding yeah i think it is nominated for an oscar level of performance. I think she is so good in every little thing she does because it's so layered and so moving and so complicated and you see her reaction. God, that's a surprise. And then she takes a moment and she says, Actually, um, do you mind if I just absent myself for a second? All that ice cream. Uh, darling, could you make, just make sure the kids are ready to go? All right, no, I'll be back in a minute. And in this moment, as she walks out of the room, again, we cut to Mia walking towards camera from out of focus, putting on that necklace. Yeah. Quick question. 
Has he had sex with Mia? I don't think so. I don't think he has, but I mean, you could argue it either way. Like, when did he give her the necklace? Did he give her the necklace mm-hmm. at work? Then no. Did he go to her house and give her the necklace? Probably. You know, and, and we don't yeah. know. And I don't know that we'll ever know. But uh, yeah. I, my, my, my feeling when, in watching it is always that, and, it's, and we don't know. And Emma Thompson sort of asks the question a little later on, like, I think that he gave the gift and I think that that's the road he's going down and going towards having sex. But I, I, I choose to believe that he didn't have sex with her yet. Mm-hmm. That's my gut too. Yep. So Emma Thompson alone in her bedroom. The song is a Joni Mitchell song. It's both sides. Now it's a song that she re-recorded in 2000. It's a song from the sixties. Um, and it, Richard Curtis hearing the re-recording of both sides. Now is the origin of this whole storyline. Mm-hmm. This is the, this, that is the inspiration for this story. Moons and Jews and Ferris wheels The dizzy dancing way that you feel She's standing there next to the bed. The lyrics are just right on point. But now it's just another show And you leave them laughing when you go. And watching the layers of her figuring out or understanding what it means that there was a necklace in his jacket pocket and he had been standing by the jewelry counter and he had been dancing with his flirtatious, attractive assistant at the party and she got the CD and what that says about her husband, about her marriage, about her life. And she's reckoning with all of that. I really don't know love at all. Which is a great counter to what she said earlier about Joni Mitchell believing that true love is forever. Here she is mm. singing about true love and, or about love and saying um, that she knows nothing about it at all after having experienced it multiple times. You know? Yeah, that's a really good point. And she pulls herself together, takes a deep breath. I love, by the way, the small detail, sometimes acting is all in small details, that she straightens the bed before she leaves. Mm, yeah. Because, because just, I don't know why, but that feels so real. That bed is, it, it's like her marriage. It's her home. Yep. It, and, and she's trying to control anything she can. Like she's spiraling, everything's falling apart. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, I can straighten this bed. Like I, that, I, that, that's the only thing I can do. It's like, or, you know, there's just like this, it's this weird, like trying to make anything out of the mess that has happened or something. It's just, it's a great moment. And then she's at the doorway about to walk back in with her family and you see her, what I call put on the face. She's Mm -hmm. putting on the face. And I got to say, as a married guy who has a kid, I've, I've done this. I've had this moment of like, I'm going through something that's heavy, but my kid needs me at that moment. And I have to go like put, you know, crush down your feelings and go be what is necessary to be as a husband and a father, you know? Oh my God. They're acting strange. And they shake their heads. And they walk out in front and you see the anger as she walks out behind them. Uh, everything she does is spectacular, I think, in this yeah. sequence. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. She's at the Christmas concert, runs into her brother unexpectedly, gives him a huge hug, never thought that she'd turn up, and he, she says, I have to tell you, I've never been glad to see my stupid big brother. Thank you. Which, does it always make you feel a little bit bad that, like, she's in the mid- middle of, like, complete emotional turmoil. Her life is falling apart. And she's like, I'm so glad you showed up. I never thought you would. This is so sweet. It means so much to me. And you're like, oh, he's not even there for you. He didn't even nope. know you were going to be there. <laughs> like, it's so, like, yeah. your brother is not there for you on any level, even a little bit. Yeah. Well, honestly, I mean, maybe Daniel will be there for her, but nobody's supporting her. You know, right, right. In, in in this small short film that we're watching, uh, she watches the Christmas show and the show ends with the curtains opening and her seeing her brother making out with who is his assistant, which is exactly what her husband. Interesting. She's concerned about him doing. Right. I've watched this movie 90 bajillion times. Yes. And I have never thought once about what you just said and how that Agreed. affects her. And now I'm never going to be able to watch this movie again <laughs> and not think about what you just said because yeah. holy 
shit. Yep. Agree yeah. with Michael 100%. Never once considered it. And now I have I can't watch it without considering that. And we have to feel terrible, every person who's never considered it, because we weren't there for Emma Thompson either in that moment by realizing the shit she was going through in that sequence. So I feel even doubly more terrible about it. Well, here, here's my secret about it. This is our second recording session. I reviewed my notes this morning before we started. That is when I had the thought. <laughs> I had the thought today. We're saying goodnight, and she goes up to her husband. Tell me, if you were in my position, what would you do? What position is that? This scene was not in the script. Mm. In the script, the movie ended, or their story ended, with her going to the Christmas concert, and then you cut to them at the airport. Oof. Alan Rickman insisted that he write this scene. Wow. He said, your movie does not have an ending. This story hasn't ended. You need one more scene. And I can't imagine this without this scene. Imagine your husband bought a gold necklace and come Christmas gave it to somebody else. Oh, the way she chose to handle it is so harsh and right and correct and brave. And it's so many things that she just lays it out yeah. in front of him. And again, this is where having two master actors is just... Because you watch Alan Rickman realize what he's done. Yeah. And I do think he feels genuinely, genuinely shitty. Mm -hmm. And stupid. Oh, yeah. God. Would you wait around to find Good out night. a bit? And then someone comes in, interrupts her, and she has to pretend again, mm -hmm. as she's been doing throughout this movie, doing what is necessary, being playing the role that she has to play. And then it's back to Harry, and she says, Would you wait around to find out if it's just a necklace or if it's sex and a necklace or if worst of all it's a necklace and love would you stay knowing life would always be a little bit worse or would you cut and run i'm still reeling from the discovery that richard Curtis <laughs> never wrote this because it makes me even more angry about her storyline and sarah's storyline no. and it really does infuriate me again like and i think john made a really good point about this like in a movie that has all these love you know it's great and christmas is amazing and people do fall in love and it all works out and isn't love grand i think it is fair and valid to tell the other side of it and to say that things don't always work out or things don't work out as you expect them to or it's not all you know roses and rainbows and christmas stars mm -hmm. but the fact that it's the two women storylines mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. end so shitty and every male in the movie gets their happy ending really mm -hmm. bugs me. And the fact that Richard Curtis thought he could just be like, hey, Harry cheated on you, but you're with him at the end. It's like, the fuck is this story? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that the writing, the line they give Harry is a really good one. I am so in the room. A classic fool. Which I think, I think, I, I don't think he had sex with her. No, and I, I and I think that he indulged himself in this, you know, midlife fantasy, and now is seeing the consequences that it's wrought. And her response. Oh, go ahead, John. No, I was gonna, I was, we're a terrible gender. We're an idiotic gender. We're a phenomenally <laughs> stupid gender, and we do dumb things like this all the time in vain pursuits of recapturing our testosterone levels when we were 20 years old. It is all of that. You can call it midlife crisis, but I think that's too small of a word or term to describe it all. Men do this. It's a terrible thing. We try to find this kind of vibrancy or relevancy uh, in that. Even the greatest of us, you could argue Frank Sinatra was the, one of the greatest, and here he is trying to mess around with Mia Farrow because he's essentially trying to marry the younger audience so he can somehow stay relevant. So it's a, it's just, it happens, and it's horrible, and it's terrible, and I love that they turn Alan Rickman, who's this great, masterful, Shakespearean-type actor, into a sad old clown as yeah. he's, as he's uh, begging for forgiveness from his wife for having even remotely entertained this possibility and not appreciated all the lengths she's gone through to make him as happy as possible in that marriage. Well, and this is what that is all in her next line, which is... Yes, but you've, you've also made a fool out of me. You've made the life I lead foolish too. Oh. She has done all these things, played all these roles, 
done gone to the stupid Christmas office party and talked to all the people she's talked to, made the paper mache lobster, showed I think she showed up at every fucking event, mm -hmm. did every single thing she was required to do yeah. because she believed her marriage had meaning. Yeah. And now she feels like it doesn't. Yeah. And he made her feel that way. He made her feel that way. And and you say, oh, well, you know, she the the women of all, but I mean and I'm not defending it, right? Because it's a legitimate claim. It's really, Lindley hates that movie for that reason as well. This movie for that reason as well. But they do get the shots in. They do get nuclear bombs in at the men in certain situations, certain sequences. And this is a nuclear bomb if you're looking at it from an emotional point of view. The fact that she says, you haven't just, you're not just a clown for doing this. You've clowned me. You've essentially... Uh, turned our life into a joke by doing this and insulted it at the deepest levels. And that's a devastating thing to hear. If you have remote affection or care or love for the person who's saying it to you. It's, you know, the, no, this scene is great and everything she mm. says is great. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more, we'll get to the end and then I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I'll, and then I'll totally say, fair. I'll say yeah. how I feel. <laughs> um, and then she does right in this moment, right as she drops, as you say, the nuclear bomb, she has to turn around because her kids are coming out yep. and says, darling, and put on the face. The face. Yeah. Darling, so you were wonderful, my little lobster. You were so. And watching Alan Rickman watch her is amazing. Mm -hmm. So it's a month later. We're at the airport. Alan Rickman shows up probably from a business trip. The kids run up, ask if he has any presents. And there is a kiss on the cheek. How are you? It's always interesting when an actor has to say the same sentence twice. And pay attention to what Emma Thompson does with this. She says, I'm fine. I'm fine. And the second I'm fine says our marriage will continue. Mm -hmm. That's what it says to me. Yeah. And there's such sadness and such hopelessness for me mm -hmm. in this moment. And she says, good to have you back. Then they head home. And that is the end of this film. Well, and actually to your point, but also the way that she said, you know, she says, here we go or whatever, let's go or whatever. And then she says home. And the mm -hmm. way that she says home is this sort of melancholic, like mm -hmm. home is no longer a warm place for her. It like, it like, fucking feels like a prison. And this is why this has always bugged me. And again, knowing that that other scene wasn't even there before makes it even worse. The, the John's <laughs> nuclear bomb scene, because at least she got that. But no. with both of these stories, it's kind of like what we were talking about with the Sarah thing, which is being in love with this person, getting your shot with that person, and then the responsibilities of your life and this dream fantasy that you had not working out. There's There's a version of that story where that person still comes out either being happy with the responsibilities that she has with her brother or making it work with the fantasy or the fantasy guy wasn't good because he didn't understand, but there's this other guy who's been waiting in the wings who actually gets you. Like there are versions of that story that do give the happy ending. And similarly here, I think telling a story where a marriage falls apart in a series of love stories is actually great. And I think really important, but I think, can she leave? Can she realize she could be happier? Can she realize she can re like, there's so many versions. And again, just because everyone else gets such an idyllic ending, the fact that she and Laura Linney just get basically your life sucks. Congratulations. Yep. And it's, and both of them suck because of familial um, responsibility. Yeah. Like Laura Linney's life sucks because she has to take care of her brother and she's miserable. And Emma Thompson likes Emma Thompson's life sucks because she is now trapped in this marriage and she doesn't love her life anymore. And that is very clear at the airport. And it just always leaves me like the fuck, yeah. like at least give one of the women a happy storyline and give Colin Firth the shitty ending or something, you know, like, it's like, mm -hmm. I just, it always bugs me because in a movie that is so critiqued for its portrayal of many of the women characters and the over-sexualization of many of the women characters, the two women that actually are the strongest actresses that get to carry their own storylines get really robbed at the end. And it's that contrast. It's having the shallow, you know, stories and women as objects on the one hand and the sad stories on the other hand, it's like that contrast is rough. And, and to me, it's funny. Uh, you said something uh, in our first part, Michael, about 
how how great it was that there's the platonic love story that we have different kinds, mm-hmm. different flavors of love story. You know what I wish this was? I wish that the the nuclear bomb scene was the midpoint of this story mm. and that this was a self-love story. Yeah. This is a story about her finding who she was and going, I can be myself and be happy with who I am. Mm-hmm. You know, that then it would be a positive, a great positive thing. But that's not what it is. Well, but I also think, um, <clears throat> and I take all, you know, I obviously agree with both your points um, in the overall result. But I also think the power dynamic of this relationship has completely changed. She is now the alpha dog. And in ways that I don't think she's bending over backwards for him anymore. But I also think her affection for him is dead or waning. And it would take a lot of effort by him to win her back to the level that she was before. And that does take time. I mean, many relationships have suffered an indiscretion, infidelity, whether acted upon or not, um, and survived. It has just taken time. And clearly they're in a transition place. Either, yes, as you said, Steve, the marriage will continue, but who knows for how long. Or, or yes, the marriage is continuing for now, uh, but I'm... I'm not ever going to love you in the way that I did before. And so I'm going to see this thing out to the kids head off to college or move out. And then I'm getting out of here. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's in play here, but you can tell clearly because he checks in with her that the dynamic has completely changed in terms of the power in that relationship, which isn't, um, it isn't necessarily something to hang your hat on, but I'm just, it's a change, you know, it's an interesting question to go just like, all right, what is that marriage going forward? You know, is she is she the alpha dog at this point, as you say? Mm-hmm. It's not how I see it, but it perfectly makes sense. You know, it could be. Yeah. Um, so Jamie and Aurelia. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's try to end on something a little bit happier. Um, it starts off. Uh, Colin Firth, who plays Jamie, is late uh, and says goodbye to his girlfriend who is sick in bed. And it's kind of sweet and kind of romantic. And this scene is a pickup. This wasn't in the original script. The original script, you just came back to this place when he hears her, but you never saw her. And they decided, no, you needed a little bit more to understand what this deal is. He goes to the wedding. He's heading home. He walks into his apartment and runs into this guy. He goes, what are you doing here? Oh, I just uh, popped over to borrow some old CDs. The lady of the house let you in, did she? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what we figure out, because he mentions their mother and that they're bad sons, is like, oh, this is the brother, and something weird and awkward seems to be going on. And then you hear Jamie's girlfriend's voice from the other room Uh-oh. say, Hurry up, big boy. I'm naked, and I want you at least twice before Jamie gets home. <laughs> With the brother. With, with the brother. the brother. Uh, sadly, that happens. Yep. <laughs> What's weird to me is like, she didn't hear him. I mean, maybe she was in the bathroom or something, but so that's not good. <laughs> we cut to a beautiful house, which for every time I had ever watched this movie, I just assumed was in Portugal, but it's in France. <laughs> and, and did you guys know that this was in France? No. Oh, that he is in France and Aurelia is in France. And then at the end, he goes to Portugal where she's from. Is that how it happens? I think so. No, because he says the airport is Marseille. I think mm. that's what he said. Now I'm trying to remember. Uh, Richard Curtis. Okay. But to me, I never knew it was in France. I just, there's this moment where he tries to speak French to her. But, I, but like, why would I ever think it was in France when <laughs> she speaks Portuguese? It, it made no sense to me. Mm. But regardless, he's in this beautiful uh, house and he's we've discovered that he's a writer because he's typing and uh, then a woman comes who it seems like has rented him the house. And um, this year you bring a lady guest? Uh, no, it's a change of situation. It's just me. Oh, am I sad or not sad? And I find this line kind of fascinating. Well, I, I think you're not surprised. <laughs> Why would she not be surprised that he's not still with the girlfriend? What would the landlady in France know about this relationship? And how well does he know his landlady? Uh, It's a weird line. It's a weird line, but I think it does contextualize that. um, Again, kind of like to what you're saying with John, like, you know, there's so much that we don't know. And there's so much that's inferred when Richard Curtis is like purposely trying to tell the most bare bones version of these stories as possible. But those lines, it kind of does infer that whether or not he, um, 
however he felt about it, I think it was clear that other people told him that maybe this marriage wasn't great. You know, when you have that friend who is with somebody who's dating somebody, married to somebody, whatever, and like, you're happy that they're happy, but maybe you don't really like the person. I have no familiarity. I have no idea. (laughs) As just in general. (laughs) Shut up. I've been been on both sides of that. But I'm just saying that like, you know, it very much feels like that was that like he was super happy and in love, but maybe other people were like, are you sure about this? And like this line with his landlady sort of, that's what I get from that. That like, even the landlady was like, this is, this is your lady. Like I said earlier, women are always more intuitive than men. She knew immediately that this was the wrong set and that this she probably saw her flirting with the gardener or flirting with a pool boy or whatever in some of those other trips. And she knew for a fact that this was the bad, wo- wrong woman for him. Um, and and she is introducing who will be the right woman, which is Aurelia, who is Lucia Moniz, who is Portuguese. And I think the casting of her is just perfect. I think she she manages to be both beautiful and also so natural. And her smile is incredible. Um, and she's going to be the cleaning lady. And of course, the one thing is that she doesn't speak English and he makes terrible attempts to speak French and Italian. And does, it's just completely awkward and goofy around her. And the only thing we hear is that he's going to have to drive her uh, home at the end of every day at work. And uh, we see them driving. Again, he's super awkward trying to speak to her. It ends up talking about Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons or something. But when he sings, she laughs. Yes. And this is the first moment of their sort of, they can't communicate, but on some level they can communicate. Mm. It's a few weeks later. And we see he's typing and we see what we're going to see from them a lot, which is this weird parallel talking, which is even though they can't understand each other, we see in her subtitled Portuguese that they're saying very similar or adjacent things. He offers her some food. She refuses and says, no, if you saw my sister, you'd understand why. (laughs) Fat joke. And just don't go eating it all yourself. You get chubbier every day. I'm very lucky. I've got one of those constitutions where I never put on weight. This is what we're going to see is them saying some like that's why I say it's adjacent. They're talking about the same topic, but not saying the same things. Right. (laughs) Uh, He's typing outside with a whole stack of pages under a rock on a very windy day in front of a pond. <laughs> it's just, it's dumb. It's a great plan. Um, and she comes up and picks up the thing holding down the papers, which fly off. By the way, there was a huge, huge fan on the set to make this happen. And it's so loud that all of this is dubbed. All this uh, dialogue is looped because the fan was so loud. And of course the pages go everywhere, including into the pond. Oh no, just just leave them, please, they're not important. And then she strips and in slow motion and jumps into the pond. I think the scene is great. I think the way it's done is great. And I actually think that Aurelia and Jamie, actually those actors do have a real connection. Mm. And I kind of wish the center of it wasn't her him watching her strip in slow motion. Do you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. that's the most objectifying moment for a relationship that's actually really fun. Yeah, everything me. is everything about this storyline is actually really cute. And like you said, all of the sort of speaking adjacently is really well done. Uh, the when she takes off all her clothes, it's a little male gazy. Like it's it like is, you're yeah. like, oh, this is definitely a male director, and we are lingering and slow motion. Yep. And again, like people listening to this will be like, Oh, stop complaining about it. Like that's a guy appreciating a woman, like women are beautiful and we should appreciate it. And like you can, but you don't necessarily need to do it in slow mo as she takes off her. Like it's, it's definitely male gazing. Well, go ahead, John. Yeah. I hear it. my, my kind of took my point. I, was gonna, I mean, this is how men see it. And sometimes in their heads, they see it in slow motion. We're seeing it from Jamie's perspective, right? So uh, is that, is that the character's name? Uh, Jamie? Yeah. 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 We're seeing it from Jamie's perspective. And she, of course, she's not moving in slow motion, but he's seeing her in <laughs> slow motion uh, as she takes her. And he's like, f- but I think he's falling in love with her. There's a way to be male gazy and still be falling in love with the woman because you can't ignore being attracted to someone physically as well as emotionally, mentally. And clearly they were having some kind of spark of chemistry and now seeing her take her clothes off in this moment uh, f- in service of him, by the way, to get his uh, manuscript. There's a little more working for him emotionally but i understand the male gazy stuff i see it a little more innocently but i totally understand if that could if that offends people 
I don't think the male gaze is like less, well, it is kind of lascivious, I guess, but I, I don't think when you say, like, I don't think it's innocent or non-innocent. I think it's just, it's a thing that's, and I think yeah. the reason it's an issue is where's the slow-mo shot of Carl yeah. taking off his clothes. True. Very true. Like, like everything you said, totally valid guys look at a woman, they appreciate her beauty. This is the way Jamie is seeing it. That would all be great if there was an equal number of female gays or queer gays in films, mm. but there's not. Yep. All yep. we ever get in film is the slow-mo of the woman taking her clothes off. And look, Carl gets pretty naked, and me, as circa 2000, <laughs> was very, very excited about all of it, so great, yay for Carl's nakedness, but we don't linger on shots of Carl slowly unbuttoning his shirt and his pants coming down, and like that dude's body is definitely worthy of a slow-mo shot, but <laughs> we don't get that. And so I think the issue is you make valid points and you can definitely justify why you would want a guy to look at a girl and appreciate her beauty. And that's all fair. It's just that we ne almost never in film get the opposite. And that's why it's kind of yeah. an issue. You get Harvey so, Keitel's penis in the piano. That's what you get. Yeah. And, and by and the way, y'all can keep it. Y'all can keep it. <laughs> well, and to underscore your point, real quick, sorry, Stephen, underscore your point real quick, Mike. Even when we get, um, uh, what's Rodrigo Santoro's? Carl. 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 Even when we get Carl half naked <laughs> in the bed, we still get Laura Linney showing her bare breasts. So that's the that's not even equal because the breasts right. are the things that are considered nudity. A man being half naked is not considered nudity. If we had seen his butt or his penis, that's a balance for Laura Linney. So even in the moment where you're having uh, a male gaze, it's still count or a female gaze rather, or gay gaze, queer gaze, as you said, it's countered by the fact that there's still the male gaze of getting to see Laura Linney's bare breasts. Uh, so it's uh, it's imbalanced no matter when they do it. So it's it's actually a very, very good point. Mike. So several things. The first thing is, is I think we are getting a little bit of the opposite in Marvel movies because there is a lot oh, yeah. of muscular dudes that the camera is lingering on. Sure. Uh, that's definitely happening here. Here's my I, I believe that sexual attraction is a real thing mm -hmm. and to go like we're not going to have people staring at each other's bodies we're just going to take that out of movies is kind of ridiculous because okay. that's part of life mm -hmm. but what i think though is like part of it is it's in the context of this film mm -hmm. which does so much objectifying it has so many right. shallow elements if it hadn't been if this had just been in a deeper movie i wouldn't have had a problem with it and here's the bigger thing why ever take your clothes off he didn't take his clothes off. Right. Because the 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 story element is she was willing to jump into the pond mm -hmm. to save his book. That's awesome. But the, we're focusing so much more on, man, she's got a great body. Right. And that's a different thing. I, I think it lessens the story. This is this something me. I brought up in the last part? And it's a fair point you make, Steve, from an American point of view. But Europeans are always chastising us for being so crazy about the, point. the female and the male body. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, <laughs> I apologize. Mike for, those of you listening, for those of you listening, <laughs> Michael literally just stood up and walked away. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> and I think that that's, I think that that's, that's a, a thing, an element to maybe throw in here because she's Portuguese. Maybe for her, it's not a big deal to take the club, jump into the water, get it. Cause she doesn't go full naked. She goes just yeah. under her face. So to her, maybe it's not that big of a deal to a lot of European people it's maybe not a big as a deal as it is for americans to see this more from a puritanical point of view so i don't know i mean i can make space for both for sure um but they do both go in the water which uh when they scouted the location this pond was like four feet deep <laughs> when they went to shoot it was 18 inches deep so they're oh. just like kind of lying on their sides or on their bellies trying to and there were creepy crawlers in this water and one of them bit colin firth on the ankle which swelled up and and they, he couldn't act for a couple of days. Wow. And again, we have the same sort of parallel talk where she says, what kind of idiot doesn't make copies? And he says, I really must do copies. Um, and he said, and this is the best one is, you know, there better not be eels in here. I can't stand eels. <laughs> Don't disturb the eels. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, what the hell is that? <laughs> And a very sweet scene. Again, it's, you know, I don't want to say all the dialogue, but some of it's subtitled, but where they're talking and they kind of are starting to communicate in particular where she's kind of asking through gestures about what kind of book it is, a comedy or romance. And he gestures a knife and choking because it's a scary story. Um, 
And then this moment, they they sit, they're smiling at each other, and you do feel genuine, yeah. real connection, mm-hmm. despite the fact that they can't quite communicate. But this, I think these lines are great. It's my favorite time of day, driving you. And there's a long pause. É parte mais triste do meu dia, deixá-lo. It's the saddest part of my day, leaving you. That's great. Mm-hmm. He drives her, and we just have the classic. He looks at her. She's not looking. He looks away. She looks at him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's the end of his time in France. They're loading a bunch of stuff into the car. They're driving. They they pick the most weird, random location. It's like on the turn of a busy street where she's getting out. And she gets out, and there's a long look. They smile at each other, shake hands. And then, before she leaves, she kisses him and walks away. <laughs> I'm like, dude, go after her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what's, like, that was pretty clear. Yeah. And, but he doesn't, gets in his car, and immediately gets in a car accident. <laughs> Poor Jamie. What, What's interesting, by the way, is that by doing this film this way, this is like one hour into the movie. And then we have very little of Jamie and Aurelia Mm -hmm. until we get to the end. Right. Uh, We do see that he's practicing Portuguese. And then it's Christmas Eve and he shows up uh, at, I believe, his brother's house. And you could see his brother in the background really awkwardly as the family, because this is a guy who slept with his girlfriend. And the family is going, hey, yay, Jamie, you're here. And there's a long moment. And then he says, And uh, I used to know. I'm off, actually. (laughs) Did he just decide in that moment? Yeah. I mean, obviously, he was learning the Portuguese. And I'm assuming with an intention of, wouldn't it be great if, or maybe I'll see her again, or maybe I'll go back to the cabin and hire her and we'll be able to speak to each other. But in that moment, I think seeing, you know, being in his brother's house and seeing his family and he was like, Nope, this is not where I need to be. And and in that moment, I mean, that's what makes it great. That's what makes it the romantic, the grand gesture is not that he was like, I'm going to stop by and tell you guys, I'm going to go to this place. He was like, Nope, fuck it. I'm out. I'm out with my shitty nieces who hate Uncle Jamie. Screw you. I got to go find love. Uh, And he heads out to the airport. And this is where, again, the timing seems we get a lot done in a short space of time. He lands in France. I think this is Colin Firth's first day on the Mm. shoot at this airport scene. And he gets a cab, knocks on a door. By the way, the uh, the dad who answers the door um, Aurelio's father is apparently a huge theater director in Portug- oh, Portugal. Wow. wow. Like Portugal's number one theater director. And Jamie says in subtitled Portuguese, I am here to ask your daughter for her hand in marriage. <laughs> and then all of this dialogue is very funny. I won't say all of it, but he calls down his daughter, not Aurelia. Yeah. And we get fat jokes, but we hear no, it's for Aurelia mm. and that she's at work. And we march off through. Uh, the streets to get to Aurelia at the restaurant. And this is awesome. Like all of the entire community, as they announce what Jamie is going to do, gets up to follow them to the restaurant. And what's really good about it. It's, this is definitely where the intercutting with the different stories really, really helps because it builds the momentum. I think if you just cut this together, it wouldn't work as well. Hmm. I agree. Yeah, totally. Yep. We arrive at the restaurant, and then Aurelia appears on the balcony. It's very Romeo and Juliet-ish. And I love, I love the mistakes in the language that we see in the subtitles. Mm. Bonita Aurelia. Beautiful Aurelia. Eu vir aqui para te pedir para casar comigo. I've come here a view of asking you to marriage me. <laughs> <laughs> And he gives this wonderful speech and she listens to it and there's a pause and we get this thing that we've talked about throughout. He says, of course, I prediction for you to say no, but it's Christmas and I just wanted to check. Mm. Yep. And there's a pause and in a brilliant, brilliant move, she says, thank you. That will be nice. Yes, this being my answer. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. You know, we've had all sorts of issues with various things throughout this film. And, but this is another example where this 100% succeeds yeah. to me. 
Yeah. Like em- emotionally, it just knocks it out of the park. And the, you know, they've announced that they're going to get married and the band starts playing and the crowd cheers and she comes down the steps and just a beautiful shot. She looks gorgeous. They have their first, they have a, a kiss and then the sister kisses him and the dad kisses him and there's applause and, uh, and she laughs and it's just like a perfect romantic moment. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's also just because this story knows what it is from the beginning to the end. Like this is yeah. a story about communication, which is great because to your point, so many of the stories in this movie are more about the physical and being in love mm-hmm. with someone's outer form. And this is com- as much as there, we talked about the male gaze stuff, like this storyline is two people that are not able to speak the same language that still figure out how to communicate with each yeah. other. And then both independently of each other, make the effort to do something that will allow them to communicate with each other even more. And yeah. that's yep. what we get to see. And and the fact that they did it independently shows that they both were on the same page, that they both felt yeah. the same way about the other. And so it's just perfectly romantic and it's perfectly perfect. This one gets a little bit of crap from some of the people who come after because, you know, oh, of course, you know, it happened. She's at a subservient position. But he's such a foppish guy through the whole sequence that it actually doesn't come across that way at all, in my opinion. And she is very much in control. He comes to her. You know, he flies to her. He embarrasses himself in front of the dad. He's the one that marches down to the restaurant. He's the one that takes the chance for all those people to be rejected. And so she's very much in the power position of this relationship. And I like the way it ends up. And it's very sweet. And, you know, I know it's a romantic comedy. Can't we have one of these fantastical storylines be okay and not be criticized? I like this storyline in the movie and i think they both do, do too. really well as actors well, look, I, mean, to your, yeah. I mean to your point i mean like i i can criticize this movie overall for there's a lot mm. of character there's a lot of male characters that fall in love with the women that are working for them doesn't mean that the romantic part of me doesn't love this story like it's right, a right. well-told story and it's well executed and it works like yeah. would have been nice to have more variety in the movie for sure. sure but you know i think a lot of times when you and again this is this whole two episodes that you guys have been nice enough to let me be a part of this is one of my favorite christmas movies i watch yeah. it every year i love it i clearly have a lot of opinions on what doesn't work about this movie <laughs> but i still love it yeah i totally agree this totally works on me it's only because it's with these other stories. It's it's mm. the the cumulative effect of all of these things. Yeah. And you know what I just went? It's like, man, if you had, although I would never change anything about Emma Thompson's performance whatsoever, mm. but if you had Hugh Grant and Emma Thompson switch roles, and Emma Thompson is the prime minister attracted to her male assistant, mm. and Hugh Grant is the long-suffering husband who stays home and takes care of the kids. You mean Alan Rickman? No, you. Well, oh. it could be Alan. You, no, I'm saying that Emma oh, Thompson's gotta, the prime minister. I mean, oh, and, and, gotta, 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 gotta. Yeah. yeah. Is that is that? Or if you make actually Alan Rickman would be better as the. Maybe we'll make Alan Rickman and Hugh Grant a couple with Hugh Grant working at the office and Alan Rickman staying home with the kids. Girl, mm. I am in. Um. Then we wouldn't. Then I wouldn't object to the Colin things as much because we have a more we have more variety in the characters. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's a month later. Jamie and Aurelia are returning to England and they're greeted by their good friends, Juliet, Peter, and Mark. And I do love Aurelia's line here. Jamie's friends are so good looking. He never tells me this. <laughs> I think maybe now I have made the wrong choice, picked the wrong Englishman. <laughs> it's a hilarious. And Jamie's response is great. She can't speak English properly. She doesn't know what she's saying. <laughs> That's a good relationship. Yeah. Yep. You know? Yep. That's a relationship I totally buy. And then we're, let's let's bring all of these stories together. We're all at the airport and we see, end up where we started, which is just the real video of people greeting each other and hugging. And there's more of them and more of them as we listen to this extended version of God Only Knows from the Beach Boys. And it builds and builds until there is a grid of thousands of embraces at the airport and all of that all of those images become a heart and that is the end of love actually the director describes the editing as a catastrophe he says it's the only nightmare scenario he's ever been involved in wow and i don't know what that means because (laughs) he didn't explain what the problem was well i do think if i were the director of this movie like when you get to the end it's kind of what we talked about like um the uh the Mark, uh, Martin Freeman storyline of the mm-hmm. two of them um 
they end their date before they go on their date. Like mm-hmm. clearly, like if you really, once you start to watch it and to your point, the logistics of who's driving where, when, and it, is it Christmas mm-hmm. Eve, but how long is Christmas Eve? And how long did you play? Like how long did you train to play the drums? And like, there's so many little inconsistencies that when you start to break down, like the logic, as you are assembling all of these stories together, um, the, the black guy who is Colin's friend, who is also mm-hmm. in the, um, mm-hmm in the, in the porn storyline. Like right. there's a couple moments where you literally cut from him talking to Colin and the very next scene is him on set talking to them yeah. and the time jump feels weird. So I do think that they did an amazing job with the editing. Cause I think that is actually what makes this movie work. But I can also see that if you were the director, you shot all these stories and then you had to assemble them and it does kind of fall apart because things mm-hmm. don't track uh, chronologically exactly. Right. Um, and you're really just like the cumulative effect of all of these stories together kind of gets you through it. But by the eighth or ninth or 10th time you watch it, you're like, wait a minute. What? <laughs> eh, I don't yeah. know. Um, it was released mid November in 2003. It got very mixed reviews, but it grossed $246 million on a $40 million budget. So that's a good, a, a hit. Uh, the soundtrack is a big hit. Yeah. Unsurprisingly, in addition to its mixed reviews, it's 64% on Rotten Tomatoes. So this is a movie, just as our review has been, that has really, really divergent opinions. Mm. Um, and I will give my final thoughts on it first, which is that there, uh, Walter Murch, who's come up on the show many times, mm. who's one of the great editors of all time, he has this, uh, this diagram that every editor or filmmaker should look at. And it's basically the reasons that you make a cut, and I I promise that this will have a point, is that what he says, and it's like a a pyramid. So he says the most important reason to make a cut is emotion, is how do you feel? That is 51% of the reason that you make a cut. Mm -hmm. So that if every single other element disagrees, but emotionally the cut feels right, that's what you do. The next one is like 25% story. And then you get into all these little technical things about the 180 degree rule and 3D space and temporal space and all these other that don't matter. And he's and those are like the tiny tip of the pyramid. And the reason I bring this up is that this movie works on me emotionally. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work for me intellectually. Is that this movie, I cry multiple times watching this movie. I find so many moments really, really fun. I totally enjoy so many of the performances. Uh, You know, all of them across the board are really, really good. Emma Thompson wrecks me. Laura Linney is amazing. Hugh Grant is his wonderful, embarrassing self. Liam, they're all great. Mm. And it's only the other 49% where I go, man, this movie is messed up. But it really proves the point for me emotionally it works for me that's my feeling uh michael what are your final thoughts uh i mean similar to what you were just saying is that i think that you know this movie is not this movie doesn't do great once you get into the squint test like once you start like you know scratching the surface a little bit there's a ton of things that you're like this doesn't really work but it was really a kind of fun, interesting journey to go on this with you guys to do each of these stories individually because i think Mm. when you do them individually the flaws uh, show a lot more. Um, But I think when you watch this movie as a whole and you're bouncing back and forth from one story to another and every actor is at the top of their game and you have these people that you love that just bring a natural charisma to these roles, um, you get entranced by it. And for me, even though the details I have plenty of issues with and we've talked about them on these two episodes, Mm -hmm. the overall idea that love actually is all around that if you tell the truth, uh, you get the happy ending and that everything's a little bit more magical at Christmas. I totally buy into all three of those things. And that's what this movie is. And the other part of it it, to the cutting of it all, you know, that Craig Armstrong score, um, Mm. that, that is not on the soundtrack. You can't, a couple of the tracks are, but the really banger tracks that they use in like every movie montage and movie trailer aren't on that. You have to like find them. And fortunately I have found most of those tracks, but that that whole ending with uh, Colin Firth going to see Aurelia and uh, Daniel uh, and the kid running through the airport to see Joanna, the music swelling and these two romantic gestures happening simultaneously and love winning and all that stuff, like it gets me every time. So I will always love this movie. Like I said at the beginning, uh, like like a problematic uh, relative. <laughs> I will I will freely admit that 
my relative is problematic and says things that they shouldn't say. And I wish that they were better than they are, but I still love them. John, how about you? Well, I mean, I, there are movies that come along and defy the critics and defy their points of views, defy the overall Rotten Tomato score or whatever. And it's because the movie works on a primal level, on an instinctive primal level. And in 2003, when this film came out, it was the right time for this film to come out. Remember, 9-11 is still just barely yeah. two years away. This idea of being in an airport, being in an airplane, in essence, I think this. I think every airline should get on their hands and knees and kiss Richard Curtis's hmm. feet for what he did for bringing back the idea of seeing your friends, seeing your family, what airports really represented to a lot of people, which is connecting with each other, finding each other, receiving each other, whether they're immigrants coming to a new uh, country or loved ones reuniting, it's there for that. And certainly that's throughout this whole film, this idea of these stories as well, showing you the multiple facets of love, the multiple angles of love. And yes, certainly the, a lot of it doesn't, or some of it doesn't hold up in 2021 for sure. But at the core, at its center, it's about love, dot, 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 actually. And that's what's important here. And that's what brings people back to enjoy the film. And the ones that don't like it have every right not to like it. But the ones of us, the, those of us who do love it, we love it because of what it says about love and what it shows us about love and the hope and the possibility of love mixed in with the realities and the brutal realities sometimes of love. And so I appreciate the film for that. And I appreciate what it does. And as an Anglophile, this is one that I absolutely love to revisit whenever I can. And certainly had a great time revisiting it with these two episodes with you guys. So that's what we think of love. Actually, of course, we always want to hear what you think. You can visit us on our Facebook page. I'd love to hear which is your favorite storyline. And do you think that the whole thing delivers or not? And you could also follow us on Twitter at Cine underscore files on Instagram at the Cinephiles podcast. Please subscribe to the show. You could do it on iTunes or YouTube or Spotify on iTunes. Please leave your reviews on Spotify. Apparently you can now rate podcast <laughs> so if you could now you got a whole new place to give the cinephiles the top possible rating uh if you want to buy or stream love actually along with every other film we've ever reviewed through amazon prime you can do it at our website cinephiles.net you can support the show at patreon.com slash the cinephiles and you could follow me at sr morris on twitter sr morris one on instagram and if you like star trek enterprise incidents john how would people find you you can always find me at the roca says on twitter and on instagram i'm also hanging out on uh, twitch there the outlaw nation all one word and head on over to my youtube channel where both of these gentlemen have been a guest and co-host a show with me on that youtube channel youtube.com slash john roca says uh, to enjoy all the stuff i'm doing there and don't forget my other podcasts the top 10 and the geek buddies uh, well, speaking of the Geek Buddies, Michael Vogel, thank you again so much for coming on the show. Yeah. I couldn't imagine talking about this movie without you. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was truly lovely to talk love actually with you. <laughs> uh, and if people wanted to find you, how would they do that? Um, go to any alley, ditch, Whoa. <laughs> shadowy corner. No, uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at M-K-T-O-O-N, M-K-Toon. Um, you can always find me once a week over on the Outlaw Nation page uh, with my boy John Roca and our boy Shannon McClung doing all the geek news on Geek Buddies, including all our spoiler reviews. And if you want to hop over to YouTube and just uh, watch Strawberry Shortcake Berry in the Big City, you can watch my show, which is currently out on YouTube uh, that I am um, show running. So um, check that out, too. I think I think between us, we could probably provide just about everybody's entire entertainment needs. <laughs> um, so that is it for this week. Happy holidays, everyone. Mm -hmm. Happy New Year. And we will see you next time for a brand new film on The Cinephiles. <laughs>